morning, everyone. I'm going to start the meeting. I want to ask us all uh, to please turn our cell phones to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid unnecessary feedback. You may notice board members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They are using their laptops to access board materials. This is an official meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt uh, the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct himself or herself in a manner that permits the board to complete its business. This meeting is available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the monitor has introduced you before making your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press the pound sign. Assistance is available throughout the teleconferencing meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, during agenda item 20, public comments on items uh, not on the agenda, the board has limited the public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, public comment from individuals here at the meeting will also be limited to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. I would like to remind all speakers to complete a presenter slip so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of the meeting is complete. Please give the speaker slips to Mrs. Toof. <coughs> Ms. Lisa Toof, hello, to my left. Good morning. I will ask, I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make any last minute comments. But we ask that you please fill out a speaker slip after your comments so that we can have it for the record. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to 20 minutes, uh, excuse me, three minutes or less. I would like to call this meeting to order and ask Ms. Toof to please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Present. Dr. Bishop? Here. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Dr. Levine? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Pines? Here. Ms. Wright? Here. Ms. Jaroslavsky? Present. Dr. Yip? Present. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll now move to item 12 public comments on items not on the agenda. I have one speaker card from Faith Gibson. Good morning. Uh, my name is Faith Gibson. I'm uh, a licensed midwife with a, uh, with this agency. Um, I have been attending medical board meetings since 1993, usually two or three or four a year, and I can't tell you how wonderful it was to be 
to be browning onions and garlic yesterday while I'm listening to the, you know, on my laptop. It was great. Um, my topic is um, is that I there was a lot of com uh, conversation yesterday about disciplinary, different kinds of disciplinary programs, different maybe than what what the medical board is doing now. And for the last uh, twenty some years, I have been talking to different people at the medical board at different times. Uh, Doug Lowey, I don't know if any of you guys remember Doug Lowey, um, former deputy director, about a way, um, um, uh, I guess you call it like the light end of the idea of discipline, which I would describe as early prevention. And one of the realities, I, I was a labor and delivery room nurse and an emergency room nurse for a long time before cross-training into midwifery. And one of the realities is, is that nurses don't tell tales. We just don't. You know, we see a lot of stuff happen. We don't say anything. We don't want to, per unless it's really egregious, if somebody dies maybe. But other, other than that, no. And there are a huge number of patients who will not actually make a complaint. The idea that they're, that they're going to do something that will challenge the doctor's license is just, they're just not willing to do that, even though what happened to them might have been pretty egregious. Um, and so what, what seems to me would work uh, to, to, to help the medical board um, figure out which doctors are beginning to like wander off the reservation of, of good sense and good care would be something that was not a, a, a formal complaint that, that that clicks into the track having to do with the requirement for you to take legal action to investigate and, and get records and all of that stuff. But merely, I would call it an incident report, but I know that incident reports are already something that kind of have their own history. So I'm going to use the word comment. But that a process, and including if this required legislation, I would be happy to, you know, to be involved in, in trying to work, make that work, so that so that people could make comments about the experience, and that would include nurses and patients and basically any family members, um, where something happened that was troubling. Um, like I said, at least in the the opinion of the person who's doing the. Uh, uh, who had the experience, not level, not the level that they wanted investigated. They just want you to know that on this occasion, this thing happened. And, um, and that these would go in the file, and this would be for physicians, uh, for midwives, for anybody who is licensed under the medical board. Um, I see I'm, I have a red light here. Um, I think you get the idea. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. I have a speaker card from Rosanna Davis. This is for item 12, public comments on items not on the agenda. Did you want to speak now? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Good morning. I promise to uh, keep my comments brief. I appreciate your time and attention today. My name is Rosanna Davis. I'm a licensed midwife for 11 years now in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also president of California Association of Midwives. I want to take a minute to thank a couple of people. Um, one is the medical board for uh, sponsoring midwife assistant legislation this year that will contribute to the safety of licensed midwife care in the out of hospital settings. Additionally, I wanted to thank uh, medical board staff for uh, assisting with uh, letters to uh, drug suppliers such as McKeeson and Henry Shine so that licensed midwives can secure appropriate emergency medications and, uh, ro and, and things like Rogam. We've been working on that ourselves, making phone calls and writing letters, but occasionally it's helpful to have uh, another authority speaking on our behalf, so thank you. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank Barbara Yaroslavsky for her many years of service on the uh, midwifery Advisory uh, Council, and prior to that on uh, the um, Midwifery Committee. Um, she's been instrumental in bridging communication, and um, we appreciate that, her years of service. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to share with you uh, and the public um, plans that C um, CAM has to implement a um, comprehensive quality care program for licensed midwives. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that today, but one aspect of it that you might find interesting is that it will include um, survey mechanisms 
for, for licensed midwives to receive feedback, not only um, uh, from the patients on the quality of care that they provide, but also uh, feedback from doctors, nurses, and hospital staff and EMS staff after a, a transfer of care from home to hospital. Of course, the overarching goal of a quality care program is continuous quality improvement. Um, we feel that a critical element of such improvement would be getting uh, feedback from other care providers. I welcome any follow-up questions, feedback, um, comments. I can be reached at president at californiamidwives.org. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, are there any additional comments from the public on items 12? I don't see any. Are there any comments from the phone? Our first question comes from the line of Kenwood Gill, who is a physician. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a physician in Fresno, California. First of all, I want to commend the um, medical board to make an effort towards making a process of registering for a PURES program easy. Um, I believe this is a very good um, initiative taken, and uh, the paperwork, I'll, I'll explain from my perspective that I've signed up for CURES September of last year, and I haven't submitted any required uh, notarized copies of the license to get an online access into the program. Um, my second comment pertains to FSMB, uh, and not in particularly about the agenda item being discussed, but it, in general about the time we've been giving to FSMB. In the past, multiple meetings. Well, we all know FSMB um, is a private tax exempt uh, organization. We have known FSMB in the past has uh, lured state board mem members with expense paid travels and they call it scholarships to FSMB meetings, thus giving an appearance of representing the boards while asserting influence for them. This has become more prevalent in the recent years. The conflict of interest is evident. For example, in a higher FSMB supported, one-third of all board members traveled to the national meeting in 2014. At the meeting, FSMB executives were seated in leadership positions in a higher state medical board. Honorable members of the board and my peers, I see this as a regulatory capture of the board comprised of few, my peers. FSMB, as we all know and I stated above, is a private tax exempt corporation which uses state medical boards to introduce legislation, thus making a market for its products which are then imposed on physicians. One such brand new product we are all hearing about is called Interstate Medical or Telemedicine Compact. We know that when a higher physician or their representatives identified these conflict of interest, Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard Whitehouse, the OSMB executive directors and an FSMB board member departed. A state ethics board investigation also uh, found uh, Chairman Lance Talmadge, which was at the time a state board member leading the push for license or maintenance of license or program implementation um, in, in a conflict of interest. In fact, Mr. Talmadge acknowledged uh, that the facts of the investigation demonstrated violation of ORC 10203 and entered into a settlement with the Higher Ethics Committee. So in summary, what I'm trying to say here is we give more than enough time to FSMP to introduce its new products and revenue streams into the individual state markets. Uh, FCVS would probably be another $350 worth of program that would be made mandatory if California was to adopt the Interstate Medical Compact. Um, there are specific items on the agenda which I would make the presentation present and I will call after the presentation is over this afternoon. And thanks for your time today. Are there Thank additional you. comments from the telephone? Our next question comes from the line of Susan Shinazi. No affiliation. Please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Susan Shinazi, and I would like to make a comment on the um, board mandating physicians to tell their patients directly that they are on probation. Um, as a former nurse, I worked with many patients um, that did not have access to Internet, and their physical condition was not such that they could be running around to public uh, computers to gather this information either. They were also patients that saw multiple physicians. So um, we're leaving out the sickest of patients, and I would like to ask the board to please consider every patient and allow them this information if your doctor is on probation so that they may make an informed decision. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comment. Are there additional comments from the telephone? At this time, sir, there are no further questions on the phone line. All right. Continue. Thank you. Colleagues, just a quick update before we move on to agenda item 13. We continued item 6 yesterday for today, and that's discussion on physician wellness program. So we can hear from Dr. Gunderson, um, who is with us today. Uh, so we will now move to item uh, 13, regulations, public hearing on physicians and surgeons licensing examination minimum passing scores. Um, We'll start the hearing now. My name is David Serrano Sewell, President of the Medical Board. I will be presiding over these hearings. Today, we have three rulemaking hearings scheduled. So I do not have to repeat myself each time. Let me discuss the format that will be followed for each hearing. Then we will move into the three individual hearings. We ask that persons in attendance print their name on the roster at the room's entrance. If you wish to testify, please indicate on the roster sheet. The purpose of each hearing is to receive oral testimony concerning the regulatory proposals described in the notice. Regulations must comply with six legal review standards, which are one, necessity. Is there demonstrated evidence that there is a need for the regulation. Two, authority. Does the board have legislated authority to adopt the regulation? Three, consistency. Does the regulation conflict with other regulations or statutes? Four, clarity. Can the regulation be easily understood by those affected? Five, non-duplication. Does the regulation duplicate other regulations or statutes? And finally, six, reference. Which statute does the regulation implement, interpret, or make specific? Testimony must address these six standards. Before we begin, I would like to briefly describe the procedures that will be followed for each hearing. The entire hearing will be tape recorded. Those persons testifying will not be sworn in or be cross-examined. All recommendations and objections will be considered by the board members. Responses to all objections or recommendations will be included in the final statement of reasons. The board will maintain a rulemaking file of this proposed regulatory action. A completed copy of the rulemaking file will be available for review at the medical board's office in Sacramento. To ensure fairness and that everyone is completely entered into the record, and to enable everyone to hear those who are giving testimony, we ask that those testifying follow these procedures. Please speak loudly and clearly. Identify yourself and who you represent. Please state your position at the beginning of your testimony. Oral testimony will be limited to five minutes per person. We ask that you do not try not to repeat testimony already given. Any written comments you have with you today should be summarized orally, but not read. As I mentioned, we have three hearings scheduled today. In the event the board wants to take a recess, the hearing presently taking place will be concluded in its entirety. A final discussion and a vote will take place. Only then, between any two of the three hearings, might recess be called. So we'll move on to the first hearing on physicians and surgeons licensing examination minimum passing scores. Mr. Warden, will you please come forward? Good morning. This is the time and place set by the Medical Board to conduct a public hearing on proposed rulemaking to add Section 1328.1 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations as described in the notice published in the California Regulatory Notice Register and sent by mail to those on the Board's mailing list. The proposed rulemaking will further define Business and Professions Code Section 2177 regarding the minimum passing score of a licensing examination and eliminate the need 
for the board to pass a resolution every year regarding the minimum passing examination score. Written comments for the regulation being heard today must have been received by the board at its office not later than 5 p.m. on July 20th, 2015, or must be received at the hearing. For the record, no public comment was received by the deadline. For the record, today is July 31st, 2015, and the hearing is beginning at approximately 9.30 a.m. After our legal counsel's opening statement, I will ask those persons who want to testify. Ms. Webb and Mr. Warden, do you have any comments? I have no comments. There, there's been no uh, opposition uh, or really any correspondence received on this, so we can go forward. Thank you. Mr. Warden? I do not have anything to add. So. All right. Now I will call on those persons who wish to testify concerning this proposed regulation. Has anyone signed up? I have seen nothing. Is there anyone else? Okay. Since no one else wishes to speak, this hearing concerning the board's... On the phone? Oh, thank you. Are there any comments on the phone? This time there are no questions on the phone lines. Please continue. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Seeing none. It, is there a motion to approve the regulation and request staff to submit the regulatory package to the Office of Administrative Law for finalization? I make the motion. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment on the motion? Is there any comment from the phone? There are no quote comments on the phone line, sir. Thank you. Ms. Toof, can you please call the roll? Dr. Bolat? <clears throat> Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krause? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Now let's move to the second hearing. This is the time and place set by the Medical Board to conduct a hearing on the proposed regulation to amend 1313.4 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations as described in the notice published in the California Regulatory Notice Registrar and sent by mail to those on the board's mailing list. The proposed rulemaking would benefit public health and safety by the increased scope of inspections on outpatient surgery settings, as well as the additional reporting requirements and the requirement that some of the violations must be reported to the board within 24 hours. Written comments for the regulation being heard today must have been received by the board at its office not later than 5 p.m. on July 20th 2015 or must be received at the hearing. For the record, no public comment was received by the deadline. For the record, today's date is July 31st, 2015, and this hearing is beginning at approximately 9.34 a.m. After our legal counsel makes an opening statement, I will call on those persons who wish to testify. Ms. Webb? I don't have any further to say we haven't had any comments thank you council mr. warden um, I have nothing to add because we have not had any comments thank you now I'll call on those persons who wish to testify concerning the proposed regulation yes ma'am sorry can thank you my name, name is uh, Lisa McGifford I'm with consumers Union and I wanted to speak in support of this change. Um, we're very happy to see um, some more details about when these um, issues need to, uh, these accreditation issues need to come to the attention of the board. Uh, and we look forward to seeing that information on the public website. And, uh, and I, I, I just wanna say that we really appreciate the work of the staff with Consumers Union over the years in 
improving that website, getting it up, getting it working. Um, I work all over the country and talk to other people and it appears that what you have is pretty unique. Um, and I think it's even unique in California because we're, people have brought to our attention that we don't have this kind of information for uh, outpatient settings that are regulated by the, uh, the public health department. So uh, congratulations on that. And I might just say one more thing about um, this section involves transfers, and I know you're not amending that section, but we're beginning work uh, on antibiotic resistance, and there we're doing some work with CDC, and there's um, a report coming out next week, and a lot of it centers on um, facilities, hospitals, outpatient clinics, nursing homes, telling telling each other when they transfer a patient to them that when that patient has an infection, especially an antibiotic resistant infection. It seems like that would be common sense that that would happen with every transfer, but it does not, and it could make a significant difference uh, if all facilities did that uh, within a region. Thank you. Thank you. Is there additional testimony from the, uh, on this regulatory item? Should I ask for the following testimony? Is there any testimony from the phone. Apparently there is nothing on the phone line. All right, thank you. Colleagues, are there any questions or comments? Seeing none. Oh, Dr. Yip. Um, I think we have a presentation a year or so ago by three or four agencies that do the accreditation. I'm interested in seeing each one of them to give us a criteria, what their criteria are to issue a letter of reprimand, well, under what criteria they revoke license and, and what they do uh, as far as the process. Uh, I'm not sure if they're all the same or they're different. And uh, the good comment from the public that uh, the transfer, the, the hospital, we do medication reconciliation. I don't think uh, they do it in our patients. So those are information I think uh, maybe the staff can collect for us too. So. That's an excellent suggestion. Are there any additional comments? Questions from the members? If not, is there a motion to approve the regulation and request staff and request that staff submit the regulatory package to the Office of Administrative Law for finalization? I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any public comments from the audience on the motion? Seeing none, are there any comments from the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Thank you. Ms. Toof, can you please call the roll? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Now let's move to the third hearing. Ms. Romero, will you please come forward? This is the time and place set by the medical board to conduct a public hearing on the proposed regulation to amend 1361 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations as described in the notice published in the California Regulatory Notice Registrar and sent by mail to those on the board's mailing list. The proposal would amend our regulations, among other things, as they pertain to license status definitions and list of disclaimers and explanatory information the board may provide with information released on the internet. Written comments for the regulation being heard today must have been received by the board at its office not later than 5 p.m. on July 20th, 2015, or must be received at this hearing. For the record, no public comment was received by the deadline. Further, for the record, today's date is July 31st, 2015, and this hearing is beginning at approximately 9.40 a.m. After our council's opening statement, I will call upon those persons who wish to testify. Ms. Webb? I have nothing, nothing further to say. We haven't received any comments on these. Thank you. Ms. Romero? No comments, sir. We have no additional comments. Thank you. 
Now I would like to call upon those persons who wish to testify concerning this proposed regulation. I see, I see no members of the audience that wish to provide testimony. Is there any testimony from the telephone? Bob, are there any callers online? There are no callers currently online. Thank you. Since no one else wishes to speak, this hearing concerning the board's disclaimers and explanatory information applicable to internet postings is closed. The time is approximately 9.41. Um, are there any questions or comments from the members? Seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the regulation to request staff to submit the regulatory package to the Office of Administrative Law for finalization? So moved. It's been moved. Seconded. Seconded. Thank you. Is there any public comment on the motion? Julie D'Angelo Falmouth from the Center for Public Interest Law. I just wanted to uh, submit a slight technical correction. I believe, Mr. Chair, you said that this rulemaking proceeding was to amend Section 1361, but it's actually 1355.35. Thank you for that. That's all. Thank, Thank you, you, Julie. With that correction so noted, I assume the motion stands. Is there any additional comment from the audience? Seeing none, are there any comments from the telephone? No, sir, there are no further questions on the phone. All right. Ms. Tooth, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Granadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell. Aye. Motion carries. I want to thank our legal counsels for your assistance in the adoption of these regulations, as well as staff. Thank you. We'll now move to item, return to item six, five, pardon me, item five, physician wellness program. Is Ms. Dr. Gunderson here? Hello. Just take a moment to set up this is a continuation of our discussion yesterday. Dr. Gunderson's CV is listed in the board package on this agenda item. Please take a seat, thank you. Um, so there's no need to go over it other than um, she's a respected and uh, expert on this subject matter. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, Mr. Sewell and uh, members of the Medical Board of California, thank you very much for your time today. And I wish I could say I was in control of the airlines, but I'm not, and I had a 24-hour delay in getting here, and I appreciate you indulging that. Um, again, my name is Doris Gunderson. I'm a psychiatrist with uh, added qualifications in forensic psychiatry, and I've been with the Colorado Physician Health Program for about 15 years, and in the last five years, I've served as the medical director. Currently, I'm also the president of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs, which is a national umbrella organization over all the different physician health programs in the nation. And I think, you know, one phrase we use internally, which I think is very important for you to hear too, is if you've seen one PHP, you've seen one PHP. And the reason for that is each state has different statutes that define how their PHP is developed. Um, I give you that information because you're going to hear different things from different states and it can be very confusing. Uh, what I want to present to you today is the model in the state of Colorado. We're a little bit, if not a lot, different than other states in how, how we're structured. Let's see if I can get this to move. Here we go. Um, I don't have any disclosures today. I'm um, not being paid for this presentation and um, just see myself as a visitor to provide information. I want to talk a little bit about our mission statement, um, our program development, our funding history, which I think is very Im important information for you today, our relationship with our medical board, our clinical structure, and some of the services we provide to physicians, and not just physicians, but hospitals, the medical board, the attorney general's office in, Cal or, excuse me, in Colorado. Our mission really is to promote the health and well-being of physicians in the state of Colorado 
And our vision is if we do that, we also promote the well-being and health of the citizens in the state where I live. Uh, we are celebrating 29 years of service. Our inception was in 1986. At that time, we were very small and I would say underfunded. And a lot has changed since then. Uh, we, our, our peer assistance program was developed through statute or our Medical Practice Act in Colorado. And in the first several years, the funding um, was variable in terms of how we uh, provided funding for our program. But beginning in 2005, we actually assessed a surcharge on licensure in Colorado. And that is about 75% of our funding now. 25% we do through fundraising activities. And each year, we have a request for proposal, or excuse me, every five years, a request for propose, proposal. And so far, um, CPHP has been selected every five years to continue our program. It's really important, one thing we did for our funding is to have a third party hold that funding for us. And the reason we did that is we wanted to not allow it to be subject to appropriations by the General Assembly in our state. In case there's some funding crisis, we wanted to preserve the funding we needed for our program. Um, between 2005 and 2010, uh, the funding structure was actually embedded in the Medical Practice Act, meaning we couldn't change that year to year. So we quickly maxed out on a surcharge of $50 per year, or, or it's actually $50 per every other year. License renewal is every other year. And basically, the way the surcharge was changed was based on uh, changes in the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics or Consumer Pricing Index trying to get an idea of inflation and, and what things cost. This slide just reflects our growth from 1986 through 2015. Um, we, at any one time, monitor about 500 physicians and physician assistants, medical students, residents, Every year we see about 350 new participants come to our program for evaluation. Some of them are monitored after that. Some of them do not require monitoring. Between 2005 and 2010, we really had a lot of growth. Um, our average caseload increased by 70%. Our new referrals increased by almost 90%. And our educational efforts or requests increased by about 85%. And the reason I tell you that is, is um, in 2010, or excuse me, in 2005, when we maxed out on that surcharge, we had five years after that where we had a static budget, and yet we continued to grow. We were all sucking air, I can promise you, during that time and made some changes, and I want to share this with you because one of the most dangerous things that can happen with a physician health program is you're underfunded. Don't do it if you don't fund it well because it's, it's not going to survive. You can't protect the public unless you have adequate funding. So the sunset happened in 2000, and at that time I was the new medical director and we also had a new executive director. And we both went into this um, very excited with the opportunity to make some positive changes, but also a little nervous that we hadn't done it before. And the, the program itself uh, relied on us being successful in uh, convincing um, our legislators to continue the program. Basically, what we were allowed to do is take that surcharge out of the Medical Practice Act. So the medical board had the uh, possibility each year of reassessing the surcharge. We weren't waiting five or ten years for this sunset of a Medical Practice Act. And we also were able to differentiate between the surcharge on a physician and a PA, recognizing that physicians typically earn more than PAs, and we wanted to have a fair assessment for PAs so they weren't overpaying and weren't overburdened financially by that. Um, the other thing we did is, um, let me see, it's on this next slide. Our, our program was continued. We had uh, some success in developing a safe haven agreement, and I'll tell you more about that. But to our surprise and delight, the medical board itself decided to develop some confidential agreements. And basically that, what that meant was even in the absence of a physician health program, 
the medical board could decide if a physician, say, had an illness, appropriately sought treatment, was better. They weren't going to punish that physician by making it a public announcement that they had been ill. And historically in Colorado, that's exactly what happened. It was very draconian. A physician would fill out a medical license, disclose an illness from the past, and that illness would be a public document. And the negative chilling effect of that was many physicians went underground. They were not going to disclose their illnesses or that they had help in the past or that they needed help in the future. So I think our board recognized that. Um, one disappointment, at least from the PHP's perspective, is that substance use disorders were not part of that confidential agreement. And I think that reflects uh, partly some stigma about physicians who are ill with substance use disorders, but also just, you know, not a lot of understanding about, um, you know, how you manage addicted physicians and how you keep the public safe. So the other thing that happened in 2011 is that the, the budget request would correspond with a licensing renewal because every two years, CPHP would get a bump in referrals because people were, were renewing um, their licensure. And if they had been ill in the intervening period, um, they would come to CPHP to be evaluated before renewing their license. So our, our volume would go up. The safe haven provision is uh, not available in any other state. And basically, it took about 10 years of relationship building between our medical board and our PHP. And I think what was recognized over time is, one, that our PHP was not hiding back doc bad doctors. We were not blindly advocating for physicians. We're consumers as well. Um, I'm a patient, and I don't want unsafe practitioners out there. But we did recognize that if physicians have a safe place to go where they are afforded privacy and confidentiality about their health care, they're more likely to come forward on a voluntary basis. They're more likely to come early in the course of their illness. Whereas with complaint-driven processes, by, by the time a regulatory agency is aware of a physician that may be performing badly or is ill or has negatively impacted patients, that's end-stage illness. Those are the addicted physicians who are dependent and withdrawing in the workplace or diver diverting drugs from the workplace. So I think our medical board recognized that if we can get people in early, we protect the public and we preserve society's resource, which is a physician. Um, we also, I think, all agreed that punishing ill physicians doesn't make them well and doesn't protect the public. Uh, CPHP is a, a 501c3. We're an independent nonprofit organization. I think it's important to share with you that the individuals at CPHP working there clinically or administrative have no immunity. And years ago, we thought about maybe we should go for immunity because, you know, we're, it's a high risk game. Uh, if things don't go well for a physician, they may sue us, and they have. But we decided we didn't want that immunity because we want to be very careful in terms of how we make decisions and we want to be conscientious both to the medical board but the physicians we serve. Um, our medical board typically refers to us when there's a new applicant who discloses an illness that may be current or past and they want to make sure that they're safe to practice. Um, in renewal cycles for physicians who disclose illness and then through complaint-driven processes. Let's, let's say there is a bad outcome at a hospital and there is some suspicion that the physician is not necessarily incompetent but ill and they want them evaluated. As it stands now, about 80% of the 500 physicians we monitor at any one time are under the safe haven provision. 80% the, the medical board is not aware of at all. And I know as a uh, a regulatory agency, that sounds very scary to you. How can we not know about, you know, 400 plus physicians? But the 20% or so that the board does know, um, these are physicians that we could not monitor very carefully without having the heavier hand of the medical board to insist that they comply with our recommendations. And so those physicians are ones that had already come to the medical board's attention or that we reported to the medical board because they weren't um, compliant, we were concerned about the public safety and we needed that leverage to get them into compliance. 
I think it's important to understand that we have separate missions, but we have overlapping goals. And that includes advocacy for patient safety and physician health. And that includes, um, you, you know, where the board wants a healthy physician population, and we certainly don't want patients to be harmed by anyone we're monitoring. I think our goals, obviously, are patient safety and, you know, we advocate for physicians to be well and practice again and restore their careers, but we don't blindly advocate. And a physician, if a physician is not well, we're not going to let them practice. I want you to hear that up front. Uh, and again, I want to say I'm a consumer. The other people working at the physician health program are consumers or have family members, and we do not want an impaired practitioner uh, practicing. Um, we also know that healthy physicians promote healthy practices. And what I mean by that is if physicians are taking care of themselves, they're more compelled to share that good health, healthy habit um, practice with their patients. And I can think of two instances of physicians I've worked with. One physician uh, smoked tobacco, and he was very shame-filled about that and embarrassed. And he acknowledged to me that as long as I'm smoking, I really can't counsel my patients about smoking cessation because I feel hypocritical. And eventually he was able to stop smoking. I worked with another physician who had morbid obesity. He was very ill from that and was able to work with a nutritionist, begin to exercise, um, successfully lost weight. And he was the most powerful, persuasive advocate for his patients who had diabetes or osteoarthritis to get them to lose weight. So I think it's important that we promote the health of practitioners who are taking care of the public. Um, with the Affordable Care Act and more patients becoming insured, we cannot afford to lose any practitioner out there. So part of a healthy public, I believe, is preserving healthy physicians. And the last point is I, I believe we put so much money into training physicians that to lose any one of them prematurely before a retirement age is a tragedy. And if you don't look at it as a tragedy, at least look at it from the bottom line. It costs about $300,000 to replace any physician who is lost to illness or um, other reasons. I have a very good relationship with the medical board in Colorado, but there are inherent tensions, and we don't see that as a bad thing. If there's too much tension, that's a bad thing because we're not communicating or there's something that's being misunderstood. If there's no tension, I would say we're colluding and we're missing something. There has to be a healthy degree of tension. And of course, it has to do with you know our, our role to advocate to rehabilitate physicians and the medical board's role to protect the public at all costs. And early on, as we were trying to develop our alliances, there was a lot of paranoia on both sides. And we thought the board was heavy-handed and punitive and draconian and, and really beating up on doctors. And our medical board really thought we were hiding bad doctors. And so over a 10-year trajectory, we really got to know each other well and learn that that's not the case at all, that we had more in common than we, we had um, differences. I'm going to skip some of this. There's also just a difference in how we communicate. With the Attorney General's Office in Colorado, cases are, are developed from a legal perspective, um, and uh, again, about public protection, whereas at the PHP, we're thinking clinically. This person has a disease that needs treatment, so that we can restore their health and get them back to practicing. So we've had to work over the years about um, kind of translating for each other what our goals are and how, in fact, they are the same, but through a different process. It's also important, I think, to recognize that um, illness is not synonymous with impairment. And for a long time, our programs were referred to as impaired physician programs. Well the physicians we're seeing are generally not impaired, and if they are, they're not practicing. And there's been a lot of focus on addiction. Uh, in Colorado, about 10% of the physicians we see have substance use disorders, and 90% of the physicians have all kinds of other things. 25% of the physicians we see have serious mental illnesses, um, burnout, major mood disorders, major anxiety disorders. 
Another 10% have physical ailments. And I think as we see an aging population, we have to consider that. For example, I, I monitor physicians who have Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and they may be well now, but because the illnesses are progressive, we provide kind of a risk management oversight for them. And when we start to see changes, we may have to ask them to have their practices accommodated. And unfortunately, sometimes they have to stop practicing. Interestingly, we also see about 17% of our pie are physicians with behavioral problems. And this is relatively new. I think you're all familiar with joint, um, uh, the Joint Commission Sentinel event, looking at disruptive behavior as a sentinel event. And I think that makes a lot of sense because it can disrupt the whole healthcare team, intimidate people so that patients aren't getting what they need. And what we're finding um, in Colorado is these, these physicians who are sometimes labeled as disruptive physicians, about a third of them actually have an underlying illness that drives a behavior. About a third of them have some type of serious psychosocial stressor, a bankruptcy, a malpractice suit, a divorce, an ill child that's distracting them and, and reducing their resilience so their behavior is not at its best. And about a third of those physicians have no illness or no major stressor. They just need to be taught how to play nice in the sandbox. They really need interpersonal coaching. Um, but about 17% of the physicians we see have behavioral problems. And we think this is partly because of the changing landscape. More physicians are being employed, certainly used to being autonomous and having more authority than they do now. But it's, it's a cultural shift, and it's changing, and I think that will um, get better over time. Um, I, I would say that if you have a physician health program in your state, the PHP needs the medical board and the medical board needs the PHP. I think we, we serve um, purposes for each agency. The way we've developed our relationship is really just to have a lot of meetings between uh, the president of the medical board and the executive director, between the different panels, between, you know, we have task forces to talk about language in our reports. We have meetings to discuss particular cases that are problematic where there's misunderstanding or concern. But a lot of communication is very, very important. Uh, just briefly about our structure, we have a board of directors, the majority of which are physicians, but we really welcome public members too. I think we need that out of the box perspective. Um, I'm the medical director, Sarah Early is our executive director. Unlike most PHPs in the country, we have an in-house team of experts to do our fitness for duty evaluations. We have six associate medical directors and four master level clinicians. Um, the clinicians are actually employed full time. And basically, uh, together we bring a lot of expertise to the table to make clinical decisions. Um, we like this model because we think we have more control over the quality in terms of the people we bring in to do the evaluations. Uh, versus relying on people in the community that we may not know very well to do these evaluations. This is a busy slide. Just It shows the programs we serve, both medical schools, all the training programs, and all licensed physicians and PAs. Um, again, most of our physicians self-refer. Uh, there may other be considered voluntary referrals that come from medical schools, family members, attorneys, hospital administrations. Um, we provide uh, clinical evaluations that are free to, to the participants. The only thing that's not free is if they need um, a more extensive evaluation. For example, if there's cognitive impairment, neuropsychological testing, we, we cannot provide. It's prohibitively expensive that will fall on the participant, or any kind of physical examination, imaging study, laboratory work we don't do in-house. Um, in addition to those health evaluations, we provide treatment recommendations and referrals. And we are very careful to keep a referral list of providers in the community that understand um, the difference treating a physician versus someone in the general public, it's, it's a little trickier with the power differential. Uh, we want to make, make sure that they have the requisite expertise, and that includes any residential programs that we refer to. We provide a lot of documentation uh, for credentialing bodies, for return to work letters, 
especially if there is an accommodation that's needed. We support families, especially when physicians are away at treatment. Some physicians go away for 90 days or even six months if they're real ill. So we meet with families, we educate families um, while their loved one is away. We interface a lot with workplaces, and it may be having meetings when there's, uh, for example, a lot of conflict in a department. I can give you an example where we had a small rural hospital in southern Colorado. The, the chair of the anesthesia department referred every anesthesia, a, anesthesiologist to CPHP, and it turned out it was more of a leadership problem than it was the individual anesthesiologist, but we were able to work with the hospital and, and get this leader some uh, mentoring that basically solved the problem. We, we also do some critical incident debriefing in the community. Sometimes there's a bad outcome and a, a medical team is very shaken by it. Uh, three years ago, we had the Aurora Theater shootings in Colorado. And unfortunately, that happened early in July when a lot of very young physicians were on call in the hospital. And so we were able to meet with uh, physicians, medical students, and residents individually, but also in group settings to debrief them about acute stress symptoms and you know what's expected versus when they should come in if the symptoms linger. Dr. Gunderson? Yes. Hello. We've had an opportunity to look at your presentation. OK. Um, if you can begin to summarize it or sure. touch on a couple of points that you really want to hit on because Absolutely. I want to allow the members to ask any questions Shoot. Sure. That they may have. Thank you. So I think you're familiar with our clinical team. I also I think something that's unique about our program is we have a patient safety committee. And early on we decided we have nothing to hide. We want to be transparent. And we invited three individuals in Colorado who are very much involved with uh, safety, patient safety in the community and also nationally. And we had them come in and we de-identified information about our clients but let them sit in on the clinical team meetings to see how we operate. And um, they have been very valuable in terms of giving us feedback about how the, how the public may perceive things or how um, we, we may want to do things differently or what they liked about what we, we do. But it, was, it really was a public perspective that we needed. We also have a quality assurance advisor. We call her our air traffic controller. Basically, she reviews every clinical note, every toxicology screen, every phone call, um, every encounter with an attorney, and basically audits to make sure we're on track with our participants. Um, very briefly, these are the occupational hazards physicians face that we address. Um, we do a lot of teaching about a lot of physician health activities in the community. We've also consulted with the Attorney General's Office about marijuana. It's legal in Colorado. And our AG's office was very concerned about physicians with dis disabling conditions that might use marijuana. And we researched the literature and basically decided that any physician using marijuana for medicinal purposes probably shouldn't practice until they don't need it. And this is a story for another day, but it's based on the fact that we really cannot monitor um, when impairment is gone with this substance. We do a lot of research. Be happy to share any of that with you. And I, we also work with our medical society on uh, wellness tools. We know that there will be disincentives for retirement after a recession. We're going to see older physicians staying in the practice. And this is really a big issue we're looking at right now. When do you screen um, cognitively? Uh, should there be a mandatory retirement age? All of these are big questions, and I hope someone else figures out the answer. So thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to field any questions or comments you might have. Thank you for that comprehensive and very informative presentation. Sure. Very helpful. Uh, Dr. Yip, did you have? It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, how many licenses in the state of, Cal uh, in the state of Colorado? There are, there are 17,000 licensed physicians in Colorado. But we don't know how many are actually practicing in Colorado. It's, it's less than that because some people are practicing in other states. Yeah. How many of your staff? On our staff at yeah. CPHP? About 20 altogether, administratively and clinically. And do you work with inpatient programs? Do we? Well, we, like some physicians may need to be inpatient mm -hmm. rehab. Do you work with them too? 
We, we refer to inpatient programs. There's one in Colorado that has a, a professional's program, but many of them are throughout the United States. And they change depending on the quality they're delivering. We may refer, we may not, depending on you know, what we're seeing. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Thank you very much for prevailing and making it to our meeting. Thank you. Uh, physicians' health is obviously very important to consumer protection. Um, have you formulated a position yet, now that marijuana is available recreationally in Colorado, uh, as to whether or not physicians can have recreational use of marijuana and mm -hmm. still be safe to practice? Very good question. Um, you know, we're, we're grappling with that. And we cannot tell physicians not to use marijuana because it is legal now. But we spend a great deal of time talking about professionalism and the fact that practicing medicine is not a right, it's a privilege. And, and we really caution physicians about how they may be perceived by the public. Um, we educate physicians about the fact that they may not use marijuana for a week or more, but still would test positive. And the repercussions of that, you know, even if they're not impaired, it's just in their urine and no longer in their bloodstream, the per perception's going to be bad. So we, you know, defer to them. I will say that in Colorado, many hospital systems have adopted a zero tolerance policy. And there was a recent Supreme Court decision. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's called um, Coates versus Dish Incorporated. And the Supreme Court held that an employer in Colorado can, in fact, fire someone even if they're using marijuana off the premises, which is, which is pretty far reaching. But, uh, you know, as I see it, another 10 years with this social experiment to really tease it all out, there's a lot of questions we haven't answered. You know? Thank you. Are there, uh, Dr. Ganadev? Oh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Granderson. So sure. uh, you said $61 surcharge for license fees. Is that per year, or is it every two years? Every two years. Okay. What does the cost for the physician, what, what percentage of your budget comes from the physicians or the physician assistants who are going through the program versus what you get otherwise? About 75% of our budget is from that surcharge. 25% comes from donations from past participants, um, hospital administrators, malpractice carriers, um, various organizations that, uh, you know, want to see healthy physicians in Colorado. So the participants don't pay any additional amount, is that what I'm gathering? That's correct. That it, everything's free beyond that surcharge. We don't have a monthly fee. Um, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Bolat. Yes, thank you for this wonderful presentation, and thank this you. is a big question that we don't have time to completely explore, but when we think about your program and kind of the upstream interventions, what are some of the challenges and opportunities? Because I think everyone up here and in the audience can remember the medical student, the resident, the fellow, and then finally the practicing physician. What do you see as some big impacts that you could make if you were going upstream a bit in prevention? I, you know, I think we really want to go move from a tertiary intervention, and I think we have, um, to secondary and eventually primary. And I can't stress enough the importance of research. We we've, we've have some research budget at CPHP, but we really want to learn more about resilience and preventing burnout. Um, what's, what's been very interesting to me is younger physicians, the millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, instead of being forced to the PHP kicking and screaming, they see it as an entitlement. If you know millennials, right, I'm, I hope I don't offend anybody, but they really think they deserve to have this. And, and they, so we see, I think 40% of our physicians now are under the age of 40, which we see as good. Because if they come in earlier, they learn habits when they're younger that they can carry into their profession that are healthy, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Lewis? I'd like to uh, make a motion to direct staff to explore setting up an interested parties meeting on the topic of physician health programs. Thank you. Is there a second? There's a second to the motion. I think this is the, the right and methodical way to proceed on this very complex issue. Um, I have public comment. 
um, and we'll get to that before we take action. Uh, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth. Then I have Miriam Hollingsworth. Good morning. Good morning, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth from the Center for Public Interest Law. As I mentioned yesterday, I audited your former diversion program in 2004 when I was the medical board enforcement monitor, and I misspoke. The chapter on the diversion program in my 2004 report is chapter 15, not 13. Um, in that report, we debunked a lot of claims that we heard back in 2004, and we actually heard some of them again yesterday. No participant in a physician health program has ever injured a patient while in the program. The truthfulness of that statement, which we hear all the time, cannot be proven or even probed because participation in diversion is usually confidential. Nobody knows who's in diversion. A lot of programs, including the medical board, would tout a success rate. 75% of the people who enter this program complete it successfully. But no program has ever, and no study has ever tracked any participant Eat those who graduate successfully or those who flame out unsuccessfully after they complete the program. So no program knows whether it has ever been effective in actually assisting physicians to recover from substance abuse or whether it has adequately protected patients. We must have confidentiality in order to encourage self-referrals. That is a fairly bogus statement in the California experience. Doctors do not self-refer into diversion to kill time on a bad day. They self-refer in order to beat a piece of information that they know is coming to the med board. A DUI arrest, a complaint from a patient or a spouse, they self-refer in order to take advantage of the benefits of that classification under the prior law. We're the best. As Ms. Robinson told you yesterday, the representatives of many other state diversion programs are all extremely passionate about their programs. But I will warn you that most other state diversion programs have never been independently externally audited, like yours was five times. We have no objection to the concept of recovery <clears throat> or rehabilitation. <clears throat> but translating those concepts into a nuts and bolts on the ground program that actually is demonstrably effective in assisting physicians and in protecting patients is extremely difficult, and I don't think Dr. Gunderson would disagree with that. If you are interest, as interested in pursuing this program or this proposal as you seem to be, I will tell you in the spirit of full disclosure the um, uh, requirements that we have consistently insisted upon since your program was um, abolished in 2008. Any such program must stringently adhere to the Senate Bill 1441 uniform standards. Any noncompliance with the program contract must be immediately reported to the medical board and the participant must be removed from practice. We would have a two-strike policy because entering diversion is already strike one. You're being given a second chance. Two strikes, strike two, any noncompliance, you are out of the program. Any new program created in California cannot be controlled by the same organizations or the same individuals who were connected to the old diversion program which failed. Please conclude. That has been attempted in, in the past and that is a huge reason why the proposals were not um, accepted. And the performance of the program must be externally audited every two years. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Felma, for your comments. Miriam Hollingsworth? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I am a patient safety advocate with the Consumers Union Safe Patient Project. I would like to speak against the secret diversion programs. The California program was discontinued for a number of reasons, including the fact that it was not successful and failed to protect the public. A case in point is that of a San Diego doctor. He had a decades-long alcohol and drug addiction. He had four DUIs in 1992, 1996, 2000, and 2002. There was never any discipline from the board for any of these DUIs, but after the last one in 2002, he entered the board's secret diversion program, of course, while keeping his license and performing surgeries. He relapsed twice during that time that he admits to, saying he usually was able to fool the bio test by freezing clean urine and using that for the test. He also dropped out of two other rehab programs. 
but it wasn't until he went after a friend slash patient with a hatchet in 2012 that he was finally put on seven years probation. That was in October of 2014. He violated the terms of his probation when he tested positive once again after just five months on probation, this was in last uh, March. And he still has his license to this day and is still treating patients according to the medical board's website, Breeze. This doctor is a prime example of why secret diversion programs don't work. All they do is keep dangerous, addicted doctors in practice while putting the unsuspecting public at risk. If you are determined to have such a program, please disclose that to the patients before they are treated so they can at least be able to give true informed consent for treatment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Michelle Monserrat Ramos. And then I have Lisa McGeffert. Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Monserrat Ramos. Back in 2003, a young political leader entered an LA hospital, never to walk out again. He was the vote director for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC, a director at the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, NALEO. He consulted and worked with elected officials across the state and throughout the Southwest. Lloyd's doctor was addicted to crack cocaine. His arrest record spanned a period of 10 years, all while he held a license to practice medicine in the state of California. Lloyd was not his only victim. A man was harmed before Lloyd. He suffered infection and a foreign object left in his body. A minor child was harmed a month after Lloyd died. There were other victims. Lloyd and the other victims had no right to know that their doctor had a serious drug addiction which directly impacted their care. There was no safe place for Lloyd. He is now dead. I checked the medical board website before Lloyd's surgery. Lloyd's doctor's profile was clear and it was far from clean. It was your job to provide me, the public, with the background information you had on this physician. You were appointed to this board to not rehabilitate physicians. You are here to protect California consumers, California patients. Please remember that. No to diversion, yes to patient safety. Patients' lives mattered, Lloyd's life mattered. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Lisa McGeffert. Good morning. Hi. I'm Lisa McGifford with Consumers Union, and I just want to make some brief comments. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm all in favor of doctors getting treatment for impairments, and have no doubt that programs that provide them with support can help them overcome these problems. But there is nothing keeping doctors from seeking such treatment with complete confidentiality today. There is no need to create a special program that interferes with the board's oversight responsibilities. The main problem here is secrecy. It is the common thread through most of these programs, and I encourage you to research this thoroughly. Yesterday I went outside and talked to the folks from Arizona who were here, and they informed me that secrecy was not an issue, that there were programs that had been very successful without secrecy. And I think someone mentioned that Kentucky was one of those states, and so I urge you to look at that. My main concern with secrecy is from the patients who unknowingly may be seeing doctors who are substance abusers or otherwise impaired. But programs like Colorado's and one proposed in recent years for California seek to have the medical board somehow involved by diverting, not having a public order, by bypassing those disciplinary orders while hiding the status of treatment, their status of their drug testing from the board. This issue of secrecy should be non-negotiable in any diversion program. The related discipline should be public and not secret, and the physician should get his, his or her treatment and be done with it, but the public should be informed 
and be able to look up their doctor's status. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have no additional speaker slips from uh, anybody in the audience. If there is no one else who wants to co provide public comment from the audience, I'll now seek uh, comments from the telephone on this item. Our first question comes from the line of Susan Shinazi from Medical Air Transparency Plan Foundation One. Please go ahead. Ms. Shinazi, your line is open. Please go ahead. Our next question comes from the line of Carmen Balber from Consumer Watchdog. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Carmen Balber. I'm the Executive Director of Consumer Watchdog. Um, a, a couple things, uh, and I may go back to the past failures of the diversion program in a second, but I was really troubled uh, by the presentation I just heard today from Dr. Gunderson in Colorado. And from what I heard, I want to urge the medical board to not go down Colorado's road. Um, Dr. Gunderson said that they are advocates for physicians, and that's exactly the wrong approach for the California Medical Board. The medical board's mission is to advocate for patient safety. And the failures of California's past failures were based on this false equation that if you protect doctors first, then protecting patients will somehow follow. Well, trickle-down regulation doesn't protect patient safety, and that is your first mission, not getting a doctor's life back on track. Um, so no doubt there's a place for someone to do that job, but it's not the medical board's job. Um, she also said that punishment is the wrong tactic because it doesn't cure substance abuse. And again, I say that's probably right, although scaring people straight sometimes is a good tactic, but it doesn't really matter because that's not the medical board's job either to cure a doctor's substance abuse problem. We don't have a diversion program today because confidentially treating substance abusing physicians, uh, instead of disciplining them, created a revolving door where drunk physicians, high physicians went to treatment, went back to practice, went back to treatment, went back to practice, and were never cured. Um, shows there's no accountability um, when confidentiality is uh, the key goal. And um, she also said that 80% of doctors they treat are under that safe haven, that the medical board doesn't know at all. And that's completely un unacceptable, and it's been one of the big stumbling blocks of every past piece of legislation that uh, the medical lobby has tried to uh, uh, restart a diversion program uh, in, in Sacramento, that confidentiality has been their bottom line, and that is a complete non-starter for patient safety. So though while I agree with the previous speakers that it really isn't the medical board's job uh, to be uh, running a substance abuse program for doctors or to be involved in it, if you go down this road, two things are, 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 absolutely, uh, are, are absolutely critical. One, confidentiality. Uh, cannot be primary. Uh, treatment uh, cannot take the place of discipline. A doctor should not be able to go through a revolving door of substance abusing problems multiple times without losing their prescribing license and ultimately their license. And that uh, one of the big problems of the past that the medical lobby uh, ran these programs also has to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there additional comments from the telephone? Our next question comes from the line of Susan Shinazi from Medical Air Transparency Plan Founder. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Susan Shinazi. I wanted to point out and, and perhaps ask that the um, spokesperson for the PHP program said more addicts would come forward for help if, if things were confidential. But I did not see them provide any statistics on this. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking that if they had some great statistics, it would tell us. So I, I don't know. Did anybody else see any statistics on that is my question. Also, um, helping anyone to hide addiction is to enable them. We, we pretty much know that. And it is such a disservice, first of all, to patient safety. Because patient safety must come first and foremost, and there is no ethical way around it. There just is no ethical way around it. To consider the money spent on training a physician does not trump patient safety. 
that is putting a value of less than the physician training on a human's life. And it does not trump the safety of the addict's life. We are also not helping a certain addict. I'm sure none of them want to wake up one day and say, oh, my goodness, I was so stoned during surgery, I killed this patient, or I was in a car accident. And hospitals are known to hide physicians' addiction problems because they use them as cash cows. And regarding them as a cash cow is to just respect that physician's personal life also. And how many will overdose before somebody will come forward and say they need help? So we cannot hide addiction for anybody. The emphasis should be on on addicts getting help, not on hiding in secrecy. Hiding in secrecy has never helped any addict. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Are there additional comments from the phone? There are no further questions on the phone lines. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the motion being uh, to direct staff to have meetings with interested parties. There was a, a first and a second to that motion. I just want to say that I, I, I'll speak for myself. I don't think I, this board, I'm not interested in replicating the board's previous diversion program. Um, so with that in mind, Ms. Toof, can you please call the roll? Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Aunt, and Dr. Gunderson, thank you so much for, for being with us today and your, your, uh, your presentation. We really appreciate it. We'll now move to item 16, 16, discussion and possible action on proposed regulations updating the manual of model disciplinary orders and disciplinary guidelines. Ms. Kirkmeyer and Ms. Romero, good morning. Good morning, members. As the board may remember, in July 2014, enforcement staff proposed several edits to the board's disciplinary guidelines. Staff, staff uh, intended to schedule a regulatory hearing. However, due to the SB 1441 regulations going through the regulatory process, staff had to wait until these regulations were finalized. As you are aware, those regulations finally were approved, so now we can move forward. Um, since the board's approval, though, we have actually found several other changes and edits identified in order to either clarify the disciplinary guidelines or to make necessary changes. In your board packet, under tab 16, on pages BRD 16-1 to 16-19, you will find the changes being recommended for approval today. Please be aware that edits in red have already been approved. Those in blue are the amendments that we are seeking approval on today. Some of the edits are just technical, such as changing the title of our agency and the version number. The large strikeout area is actually a change in the manner in which these guidelines are provided. In the past, the document would identify what changes have been made. However, those changes are all identified in the regulatory document, so we're asking for us to eliminate that section. One significant change is in aligning the sections on cease practice orders to meet interim suspension orders, moving the need to file an accusation from 15 days to 30, as stated in the government code on interim suspension orders. In addition, staff realized that there was an error in the writing on the final decision by a board as compared to an administrative law judge. In the prior version, it appeared both the judge and the board had a total of 15 days to issue a decision. However, the intention was that each party would have 15 days, and this amendment is recommended. This is more in line with the government code sections as well. You'll see those changes in conditions 9, 10, and 11. The changes to the conditions 14, 15, 17, 18, and 23 remove the specific reference to the University of California San Diego PACE program. We believe that now that these conditions are established, the board should no longer have one specific program identified, but instead say a program approved in advance by the board. On condition 28, at the July meeting, the board approved the condition to include nurse practitioners, but we did not update the title. This amendment does so. All other amendments are technical. 
So therefore, at this time, we're asking for a motion to approve the language as proposed and to notice the language for a public comment period. In addition, we are seeking a motion to set this regulatory hearing for the October board meeting. So moved. So moved. There's been a, been a motion and a second. There's been a motion and a second. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions? Dr. Levine? Um, uh, just a just a question. Um, adding advanced practice nurses um, to PAs, um, it seems to me one a different or technical a way to do this would be to stipulate rather than categorical uh, categories of people. Say any any um, allied health professional who requires physician supervision, such as, but not limited to, um, PAs, advanced practice nurses. There are other categories of health healthcare professionals um, who operate under um, protocols or whom, or whom physicians supervise that might fall into this category. And I wonder if that's not the real intention of the change. The, the problem is is that if you took if you didn't limit it to those two you would be looking at RNs would you want to stop them from supervising RNs medical assistants um, who else would I'm, I'm thinking of others that are in there we're, t we're talking about more of the high-level entities that can practice on their own I know what you're saying because there might be I don't want to miss a category but I don't think we can go as broad as other allied health. So pharmacists can do certain things under physician protocol, right? But they're not supervised, are they? They're well. They have protocols in, in place that the pharmacy board put in place, I believe. Right, but there is a signature to the. I, maybe this is a conversation right. for. I don't want to hold this up. Okay. But but I, I think we ought to think at through. It? Okay. Are there other categories of supervisory? behavior either directly or indirectly through signing off on establishing protocols protocols under which okay. allied health providers provide right. care that might need to be considered for a future. Well, and it might be allied health provider. Yeah. If we use yeah. the word allied health provider, and I'll check with um, legal counsel, um, that might actually work um, because a nurse is not an allied health provider. So I don't think. I would uh, not recommend changing the language at this time uh, and also advise that there is some danger in the physician's functionality if we're overbroad because a physician in his or her daily practice has some supervision over scribes and medical assistants who in and of themselves don't have any prescribing authority. Mm -hmm. uh, the real intent, I believe, is to avoid a circumstance where a PA uh, working with prescribing authority with physician supervision may not be appropriately directed. But we don't want to prevent a physician from having any supervisory uh, role. So I'd be in favor of leaving today's language as it is, uh, but to consider uh, whether or not we need to add other categories without being overbroad. Thank you. Are there any additional comments from the members? Seeing none, are there any comments from the audience? Ms. Romero. Good morning, Gloria Castro, senior Sorry. assistant. <laughs> it's okay, I know who you meant. Uh, Gloria Castro, senior assistant, uh, attorney general for the health quality enforcement section. Uh, just to clarify, uh, our section would recommend leaving it as written. Our issue mainly um, in stipulations is to be able to limit the ability of a physician to supervise a nurse practitioner furnisher that in their own right sometimes can prescribe as like PAs who are under protocols as well. Um, generally, we can uh, get a stipulation from a physician if there are any issues with medical assistance or respiratory care therapists or other subsets of uh, practitioners that may work 
in tandem with the physician in a medical practice. So from time to time, if that's the issue, that we don't want a physician to supervise medical assistants because maybe he or she tries to date them or is doing something very unsavory, we will put it in a step and make it a part of uh, what is required during the probationary period. But um, our main concern and goal uh, from my perspective is to make sure that if we're putting a physician on probation for prescribing issues, that they also not be able to supervise other people who can prescribe as well as in their supervisory capacity. That's the only comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional uh, comments from the audience on the motion? Are there any comments from the phone? There are no comments on the phone, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Ms. Tooth, can you please call the roll? Dr. Bolot? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Dr. Levine? Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Jaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Watson? We're going to, hello, good morning. We're going to move to your item if you're ready. Okay, we'll, we'll, thank you. We will get to item 17 momentarily. Uh, we'll take an item out of order. We'll do item 19, executive management reports. Ms. Kirkmeyer. Good afternoon. Um, Ms. Toof is passing out the information on the orders, and so I would like to actually begin by asking for a motion, um, once those are handed out, to approve the orders following completion of probation and orders for license surrender during probation. Is there a motion? So, so moved. So moved. Second. Seconded. Any comments from the members? Seeing none. Are there any comments from the public on the motion? Seeing none. Are there any comments from the phone? No comments on the phone, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Tuf, please call the roll. Oh, Ms. Yaroslawski? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Wright? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Bolot? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. I vote aye. The motion carries. Okay, I would like to take a moment to introduce, I think she's back there, um, the board's new chief of enforcement, Christina Delp, if she would stand up. Ms. Delp came to the board from the Contractor State License Board, where she was the deputy chief of enforcement. We are pleased to have Ms. Delp join the board. Um, I'm not going over the administrative summary the, summary, the enforcement program summary, or the licensing program summary, unless someone has a question. However, I would like to let the members know that the member excuse me, Memorandum of Understanding with the California Research Bureau to perform the disciplinary demographic study specific to ethnicity was signed this week and now work will begin on this project. This MOU was delayed because there was a leadership change at the Bureau and the board needed to wait until the new leadership took over to review the MOU. They have asked for data that we will actually be sending them on Monday, so they're hitting the ground running on that study. Pursuant to the directive at the last meeting, I have met with the AG's office and the DCA investigative unit to look into the interim suspension orders and the ways to strengthen that process. At our next meeting, we will be looking at criteria to identify what cases may warrant an interim suspension order. The thought is that once we have this criteria, we can provide training to the investigators and deputies. Several more meetings will be held and a final report will be provided at the October board meeting. I do not have a Board of Pharmacy update except to let you know that they conducted their final review of the comments on the hormonal contraception and naloxone protocols at their meeting earlier this week. We will let you know the outcome of the meeting at the next, uh, uh, outcome of their meeting at our next meeting. In regards to the coordinated effort with other state agencies regarding the issue of prescribing psychotropic medications to foster children, We've finalized and signed the data use agreement with the Department of Healthcare Services and the Department of Social Services. We also received the de-identified information from them as requested. 
At this time, we are locating, locating a pediatric psychiatrist that can review this information that has been provided to determine if physicians who may be inappropriately prescribing can be identified. Once that occurs, we have to work with the Department of Social Services to obtain patient releases so we can obtain medical records and investigate the case. This project has been delayed due to the need for a pediatric psychiatrist. However, we did meet with a pediatrician to review the records, and we're actually unsure at this time how useful the information we have um, basically obtained is going to be, but with the assistance of the individual and also with the assistance of the pediatric psychiatrist, we may be able to identify a more useful request for data from DHCS and the Department of Social Services. In addition, staff will be attending a webinar hosted by these agencies to discuss psychotropic medication data sharing efforts, and we're hopeful that once we look at that, we may be able to use their information to obtain more information that we can use. The webinar is going to be held next month. Yeah, just, do you have, can you give us a sense of the numbers of children in foster care who have been prescribed psychotropic meds? I'm just a... Ballpark number? I can't off the top of my head. I can email that out because I know we've heard it in, in presentations where I've written it down, but I will send it to you. I, I want to say it's in between 60 and 80 percent of the individuals they said in foster care were on psychotropic medications, but I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me. But it, it's, it's a draw. Yes, Dr. Levine, it is actually a, a jaw-dropping number, um, which is, I think, why we're all where we are looking at this issue. Yeah. We continue to encourage anyone involved in the foster care, uh, care of foster children, though, to notify the board of any physician they believe may be inappropriately prescribing. Um, the next item on the agenda is actually an update on the CARES program. And as you all know, the board has been involved in this project for some time. But I've actually asked Robert Sumner and Sandra Thuston, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, from the Department of Justice to attend the meeting today and to provide a very brief update Mr. Sundminer, can you please give us the update on CARES? Uh, yes, good morning. I'm happy to provide a quick update. Again, my name is Robert Sumner, and I'm a Deputy Attorney General working in the Office of Legislative Affairs for Attorney General Kamala Harris. Uh, and with me is Sandra Thuston, who is a, uh, a manager at our CGIS Division for Justice Information Services, specifically working on uh, law enforcement services. Um, CURES 2.0, uh, about a month ago on June 30th, we announced that the site is live. It is now in what is called in a production environment. Um, and we are very excited for this release because it contains a number of features that we think are going to be very useful both to the regulators and to the users of the system. Uh, our priority right now is on user acceptance. One of the uh, issues that we identified during the user acceptance testing phase was that on the um, side of the user, there were a number of issues that needed to be worked out to make sure that adoption could be done smoothly uh, from the 1.0 system. So uh, in lieu of forcing everybody onto the 2.0 system all at once, what we've done is we've done a soft launch into a production environment, and we are transitioning in users in phases. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, transitioned in the regulators, and we're working through uh, the regulated use of the system. We're working with uh, both this board and the other boards that will be using the system from a regulatory perspective. Uh, and then in phases, we will be uh, initially bringing in certain uh, user groups from the prescriber side. Uh, that include large health systems that we are identifying to partner with in order to identify things like browser security issues and other types of adoption uh, concerns. Um, that will be rolled out uh, systematically. We'll be providing regular updates based on uh, where we are in the rollout. Uh, and we hope to have a, a full rollout of the system uh, next year, uh, particularly in light of the fact that I think that it's going to be a, a much much improved product than the 1.0 system the team's been working very hard on and I think that both uh, the prescriber users and the regulatory users are going to be very pleased with uh, what they're presented with. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or Sandra is here from a technical perspective. Dr. Lewis. Uh, I heard you mention that you're going to be rolling this out or either beta testing or something with larger corporations or larger groups, right? But we must not forget about the small individual practitioner who's going to be struggling with this system which always already has its issues and perceived issues and the internet issues and your solo practitioner is going to be, I think, struggling. And I'm wondering if you've thought about that end user and maybe test it with 
those uh, practitioners and maybe eventually have a roll-in phase where they're not expected on day one to be like the big in corporation. So can I have your thoughts about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to respond to that. Uh, like I said, user acceptance is our priority right now, and I think one of the things that we're trying to remain cognizant of is the fact that every practice is going to be different, whether uh, it's a large system or a solo practitioner, or even you know varying from a small practice to another small practice, there can be differences in the way that that uh, particular environment has been set up to address the needs of the patients that um, go to that caregiver. Uh, so one of the things that we've been focusing on right now as far as, you know, targeting larger systems is because that gives us a fairly good control group of users that all kind of work within the same environment. They're on a same integrated health system, they use the same browsers, they have the same policies and procedures that are specific to them being affiliated with that larger practice group. Um, so that's the reason why early phase-ins are going to be, you know, targeting uh, larger potential systems because that gives us the ability to kind of see you know, evenly how the system is adopted through a fairly cohesive group. Um, but as we do the phase out, we're definitely going to be focusing on the fact that, uh, as particularly uh, in size differences and practices, uh, you will see different needs and different experiences. And I think that we're also, um, you know, cognizant of the fact that there is a legacy of frustration with some of the smaller physicians in terms of use of the system. And that's why user friendliness, at least from my perspective, is definitely uh, the number one priority of the system launch. And I think that uh, the way that we release the system, like you said, in terms of rolling in, uh, is going to be one of the things that we're looking at very carefully as we proceed with the system update. Ms. Yaroslavsky? I want to thank you for being here today. Um, but I want you to understand that there is a, a level of frustration that I have as to the feasibility of this system working come January 1st. To that end, I'm wondering, I mean, completely online and people are going to have to use it. To that, I'm wondering, is there any opportunity within the system, in addition to rolling it out and us, you're telling people how they're going to do things, as to people allowing comments to come to you? So like a pop-up on a uh, your website or a pop-up on the rollout opportunity so that you could hear directly fr what the frustrations or what the barriers are to usage from those that are in the trenches. Um, yeah, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, just to clarify for, for those who, who might have misinterpreted, there's no requirement to use the system effective January 1st, merely a requirement to register to be able to use the system. It's still discretionary uh, for practitioners to actually consult the system as part of their practice. Um, we are currently concurrently running the 1.0 and the 2.0 system. Uh, and as folks are rolled into the 2.0 system, there will be a feedback page that goes live, and we will be soliciting. Uh, concerns. In the meantime, anybody that's already adopted the 2.0 system, uh, our help desk has been available and they've been very active in working with the current users uh, who are regulators and they will also be um, well prepared to work with the prescriber users of the system as well. Um, I know that even uh, this week we've been working with several of the current adopters who adopted it early as part of the regulatory uh, board role and they've been working with our help desk to resolve any issues for them, and that's something that we hope to expand to the larger user acceptance. So do you have a perspective of those that have started to use it already to register? Use for me means registration to be able to use it. Do you have a, an idea of what the satisfaction rate is on that? That people that have been asked to sign up, are they able to sign up? Is it 100% participation by those that want to? Or are there barriers to being able to do that, and how are you alleviating those kind of issues? That may be better well stated. Right. So the, the current registration process is still um, for the 1.0 system is the same. Uh, we've kept continuity in that for users to continue to register uh, through the current process, which you know is also aided by uh, the board. I know that Cures' registration is being accepted at this meeting as well as at others. Um, for the 2.0 system, uh, we have had, uh, you know, a largely successful registration process. Um, some of it, a lot of it, is user end and having to you know make it clear, and that informs things like training and like on-site uh, instructions. And then, uh, just to consult with my colleague, I believe that we've resolved all registration issues, and we currently have good adoption. So we are we have resol resolved all of those issues, and um, the feedback that we have received from the users has been very positive. We work through some issues that um, have occurred individually, um, but overall I do believe that the user base has been positive. Thank you. Are there any, Ms. Bolat, Dr. Bolat? 
Yes, thank you very much. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. You're talking about the rollout and you're phasing it in and you're doing big systems. Can you tell us just kind of sequentially who you've rolled it out to and what was the vetting process for, the pro for how you decided this? Uh, sure, I can begin to answer that question and, and then I'll defer to my colleague on some of the technical aspects of the rollout. I can say that the current process is that we're making sure that whatever prescriber group is in the system, there's already full regulatory use of the system. Uh, and so the current uh, phase of the rollout involves making sure that the regulators uh, that have access to the system and use the system as part of their oversight practice uh, are you know, fully integrated into the 2.0 system and that they're prepared uh, to interact with a prescriber base or, or a um, dispenser user group. Um, and then from there, we're phasing it out in ways that allow us to, you know, to continue to inform things like training materials uh, and address any sort of user and network issues, firewall issues, things like that, uh, particularly is what the role that I can hand over to Sandra. So the rollout is a, a very controlled process. So those, those organizations that um, we have been working with, we... Um, coordinate directly not only with their IT but with their medical staff because the system is not just widely available. We have to onboard individuals. So part of that is working with their IT organizations and once we get the IT issues addressed, then our uh, business program area will coordinate with the user base to provide on-site training. So we are going on-site and providing training to all of the users and also assisting them during that process when they go back to their work area to uh, be available to uh, walk them through any of the problems that they may experience. Thank you very much. I just want to follow up to be more specific. Is it public information as to whom you are rolling this out and, the, and so that we, you know, say you say the regulators. So who are the regulators and who is this rolling out to? So that, you know, there's a lot of confusion from the physician community. People are very concerned come January, they're going to have to do these, um, and they should be. We, we, we all as a board uh, agreed that this is a good thing to have the cures, um, to at least check prior to prescribing. But there's going to be a group of physicians, let's take our surgeons, that are going to do 30 cases, 50 cases a week. What does that mean to them? So we want to try to decrease that anxiety. So can you answer that for me? So the um, first group that we have onboarded in was the medical board users, and we have also onboarded some of the law enforcement um, agencies within the Bureau of Medical Fraud and Elderly, Elderly Abuse. We have been um, working with a few other of the larger groups, uh, medical groups, to coordinate this process as well. So. Uh, UC Davis is one of the organizations that have reached out to us with an interest in coming on board sooner than later. And, and just to speak specifically, I mean, I, I believe that uh, we have our June 30th uh, one-page notification, and one of the things that we try to emphasize in that is that a user should not be uh, taken by surprise when they are expected to comply with the 2.0 system, and that's something that we're going to be continuing to communicate so that uh, there is advance notice and that there's a, a really good universal understanding for when will 2.0 start applying to my practice and what will I need to know to make sure that I'm both complying with the law and integrating in a way that won't be any sort of disruption to my, uh, my practice area. Dr. Ganadev. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Cures 1.0 has been really tough to use. 2.0 is, we don't know where it is. So January 1, when we get on, if I get on Cures 2.0, do I, will I get real-time information? That is, the, if a patient went and got prescriptions filled yesterday, day before, for in a couple of different pharmacies, is that information going to be available for me? Sure, I'm happy to answer that. So, uh, I mean, the phrase real time is, is an interesting one. Uh, in order to be able to... Only a uh, lawyer would say. Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> Right. Uh, I, and the reason why we avoid it is from, from a system technical perspective, uh, the, the IT potential of the Cures 2.0 system is, is just dramatically better than that of the 1.0 system to the point where once there's been a patient record entered into the system, uh, it is virtually real time to be able to, to check it and, and see that that's been uh, added to that patient's history. Uh, where we you know, do need to add a caveat is the fact that there is the time uh, prior to the fact that the 
uh, prescription has been dispensed, but it hasn't been entered into the system yet. Statutorily, I believe they have seven days to enter it into the system. Uh, so in the sense that once it is part of that patient's history, it will be immediately available to the physician or, or the other prescriber who checks the cures database. Um, the only reason why I would, I would hedge on real time is because statutorily, we do have to allow up to seven days to enter in that record. I'm just curious, I mean, with the technology so advanced, why can't it be scanned as it is dispensed into the cure system? I mean, these are easy things in pharmacy nowadays in the hospitals. Everything is scanned. I mean, we know who gets what by the medical record number, by a scanning mechanism. Why can't we do that rather than manually entering within one week? I mean, you go into the next step, so why couldn't you go there and these are, uh, these are not uh, high, extremely high-tech systems, they've been in place. And I think you're right. I think that there is a lot of potential to continue to improve the system. Um, I've already been making the Cures 3.0 joke for a lot of ideas that I think are, are you know, kind of ripe for discussion as soon as we're finished uh, implementing the statutory requirements of SB 809. Thank you, Mr. Summer and Ms. Uh, Thunston for being here and joining us today. It's a complex, complicated issue, a lot of challenges, so these updates to this board are greatly appreciated. Thank you for being with us today. Are there any comments from the public on Ms. Kirkmeyer's executive report? <clears throat> Seeing none, are there any public comments from the phone on Ms. Kirkmeyer's report? There are no comments on the phone lines. Please go ahead. Thank you. To both, we appreciate it. Send our best to the Attorney General. I will. Um, I'm going to take one more item out of order, and then we will do the uh, Federation report. And if we can have Ms. Christine Lally, item 20, update from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Good morning, President and Board Members. I'm Christine Lally, Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Always a pleasure to be with you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to address you. Um, there are three main issues that I'd like to update you on. First of um, the three is the BREE system. Over the past several months, I'm happy to re report that the Department has released many reports and data extracts that release one board's can use to track their workloads. Of particular note on the enforcement side is the recent availability of a report providing robust data on cases referred and pending at the Attorney General's office. The report also provides information on outcomes of the disciplinary and administrative processes. Reports providing similar levels of detailed information on intake and investigations are currently on track for late August or early September delivery, as testing of these reports is still in progress. The department is committed to not releasing these reports if critical issues are not resolved um, during the testing phase. We thank the medical board staff who have participated and provided very valuable input in the design and testing of these reports. Conversations with enforcement subject matter experts from all of our boards resulted in many enhancements to these reports over the legacy system counterpart reports, which increased the complexity and pushed out the delivery schedule. On the licensing side, data extracts of licensing applications received pending and completed are also provided on a regular basis to the boards by the department, either monthly or biweekly, depending on the type of extract. In the future, these data extracts will also be made available as reports capable of being run on demand. I'm also happy to report that the final maintenance update for release one boards before the launch of um, Breeze release two is scheduled in September. The department is grateful for the medical board staff for continuing to communicate their maintenance priorities as it ensures the most critical issues or enhancement requests are resolved in a timely manner. Release two um, of the BREE system is scheduled to launch in December. Release two, as some of you may know, includes seven boards and one of our bureaus. 
Release two will include fixes and enhancements for release one boards, which I'm sure you're very happy to hear. <laughs> the maintenance release schedule has not been finalized for release two just yet. However, DCA recognizes the need for frequent scheduled maintenance releases, and we will be working with the vendor to create a schedule that supports the needs of release one boards, as well as release two. Also, aside from scheduled maintenance releases, the department is always willing to address critical issues via emergency releases, and again, we work very closely with your executive director on prioritizing. Next, I'd like to update the board on the North Carolina Supreme Court decision. Since my last update at your May meeting, the Department of Consumer Affairs Legal Office continues to work closely with our agency, the governor's office, and the attorney general's office on this Supreme Court decision. Specifically, the department's legal office is developing training for executive officers, board presidents, and board councils on its impact. We anticipate this initial training to occur in August with a date to be determined. I don't have it, unfortunately, today, with subsequent training provided to all boards and members. DCA Legal is also tracking developments in cases filed in other states, which may impact California. Two examples of cases include in Texas, where the medical board is comprised of a majority of licensees, a case is pending related to a regulation uh, related to restrictions on telehealth practice. Second, in Mississippi, the medical board is made up of nine practicing physicians a case is pending related to a regulation restricting who can own a pain management clinic. Um, at your meeting yesterday, you had a visitor, Senator Hill, who is the chair of the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. Um, as I'm sure your executive director has updated you, he has requested a legal opinion from the Attorney General's office on the impact of the case or the, uh, the Supreme Court's decision to DCA boards and if the current DCA board structure provides sufficient active state supervision. We've also been notified that it's likely that Senator Hill and the legislature will hold an informational hearing this fall. The department's legal office, as I've mentioned to you, um, will be providing specific direction to all of our boards. In the meantime, we continue to ask that you please keep your assigned counsels apprised of any questions or um, concerns that you have regarding the Supreme Court decision. Um, finally, I'd like to take a moment to update you on the department's pro rata study. Enacted into law earlier this year in January, Senate Bill 1243, which was auth authored by Senator Hill, he's been busy. <laughs> required the department to prepare a one-time study of our pro rata system and the way expenses are distributed to boards and bureaus. In December 2014, the department commissioned CPS HR Consulting to conduct this study, which consisted of two parts. First, a survey of the boards and bureaus, and second, an analysis of the way pro rata costs are distributed um, to the boards and bureaus. Nearly all of our boards and bureaus participated in the pro rata survey, um, which CPS conduct conducted in March. While we appreciate the majority of our services provided by the department are valued by our boards, we all also recognize that improvements can and must be made. The survey found that areas um, that we need to improve on include one, customer service, and two, timely timeliness. Um, that was, those were the two main concerns raised by our boards and board staff. I want to assure the board that we are taking the results of the survey very seriously and using them as a starting point to initiate improvements at the department. If you have any interest or would like to review the pro rata survey, um, the cost analysis and other documents provided by CPS, they're available on the DCA website on the main page. And with that, that concludes my update. And always here if you have any questions or concerns that you'd like me to share with the director. Thank you. Sure. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Yes. Ms. Lally, thanks for coming. Always. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, yesterday, we, we were presented with a customer survey and applying for the medical license. 
through breeze and the results were awful. So that's why I just want to let you know that we need to improve. Uh, I, di I did see that in your meeting materials. So and I, sh I want you to know that when I saw it, I shared it with our IT team to make sure that they were aware of that. And that was a really nice opportunity. I mean, I think Kim for having the foresight to include that in her survey. That was helpful information to receive. And work with our licensing chief. They're getting uh, increased phone calls because they can't really go through the process. So that, that's important to get mm -hmm. uh, taken care of. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Are there any additional questions or comments? Dr. Yep. Uh, during the provider survey, is the salary of the investigator being considered? We have an issue that our investigator consistently probably not pay as competitive as that agency we have problem retaining them. Well, I will defer that to my colleague who is here in the audience who will be doing a presentation in a little while, Mr. Gomez. I think I don't want to give you a preview, but I, <laughs> I believe that's in his presentation. Thank you. He's going to address that. So I'm happy to defer that one. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, seeing no additional questions or comments from the board, are there any public comments on Ms. Lally's report? Seeing none, are there any comments from the phone? We do have a question from the line of Carolyn Navarro, mother of patient. Please go ahead. Yes, I have a customer service comment since that's what she was mentioning just now. And I would like all of you to please Google the Medical Board of California on Yelp because other people have the same complaint I do. Um, the only good review is from a person who appears to work at your agency. Her name is Sun. Um, and so I feel strongly you ought to go on Yelp and look what people are saying because I'm feeling the same thing that other people are saying, um, that you're not acknowledging complaints, you're closing complaints prematurely, um, and you're losing people's letters. That's another thing that people have commented about. So. I feel strongly that you really need to go on there and look yourself up because Yelp is much more credible to me right now than your agency is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there additional comments from the phone? No, sir. We have no other questions on the phone lines. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lally, for your Thank report. Thank you. We'll now move to item uh, 17, presentation and update from the Federation of State Medical Boards. And thank you to Dr. Watson and Mr. Dugan for being so patient uh, with us. And it is a real pleasure to have you present this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Watson. I am the, a member of the Federation of State Medical Boards, and I serve as an FSMB liaison director to the Medical Board of California. I also happen to be the immediate past executive director for the DC Board of Medicine, and currently I'm now the chief of staff for the Department of Health. With me today, I have Mike Dugan, who is the chief information officer and the senior VP for operations. We're pleased to be here with you today, and uh, initially we were told we had 30 minutes. We're going to truncate this to 15 minutes, and I certainly understand. Um, what we'll do is breeze very quickly through the nice-to-know slides and try and focus on the ones that we really want you to know about and based on feedback we got from Kim. So very quickly, we'll go through the background of who we are, the services and educational offerings the Federation provides, and then spend a bit of time on some of the advocacy updates, uh, policy initiatives, and, and other items that we think will be important to you. So who are we? Meet the board. We are actually a 16-member board. Uh, we are chaired by Dr. Dan Gifford, who is a nephrologist, and the president and CEO of the board is Dr. Hank Chaudhry. They all bring you greetings, and there's a long history with the California Board, as uh, four previous chairs have served as chairs of the Federation of State Medical Boards. And then, of course, Kim is a very active participant. You're our executive director, and currently serves as an advisory member to the USMLE advisory panel, 
and she sits on the FCVS Advisory Council and uh, the Medical Marijuana Regulation. So thank you, Kim, for your participation. The Federation is headquartered in Texas. It was founded in 1912, and in 2010, opened an office in Washington, D.C., which serves as the advocacy office. The Federation represents 70 member boards and is essentially run by the House of Delegates and the member boards. Vision and mission. I'll just breeze through very quickly, although very important for the organization. Uh, the uh, Federation recently held a strategic planning uh, retreat uh, last year in 2014 and focused on looking at the vision and mission, making sure it's current for the next uh, five years, and uh, highlighted areas that the organization will be focusing on uh, for the next five years so that we meet the needs of state member boards. The five-year strategic plan will look at the structure and function, major trends impacting the medical regulatory environment nationally and internationally, challenges and opportunities affecting the key stakeholders and information on the changing national healthcare policy landscape. There's a lovely circle grid, you can go online and take a look at it, but it goes into more detail about all the strategic goals and what we'll be doing. Uh, very quickly, I just want to share with you an update on the physician census. As of 2014, there are roughly 916,264 physicians with an active state medical license. Uh, roughly net of 12,168 physicians were added to the nation's physicians roster each year. And the average age is now older and predominantly male, but increasingly female at the entry level. And a very interesting group is the international medical graduate numbers, which we've been seeing inching up, with the majority of them coming from Caribbean medical schools. Currently today, roughly a third of the U.S. medical workforce comes from international medical graduates. This is a map of the United States, as you can see, and we're taking a look over your section here on the West, 15% of U.S. workforce is represented by California Medical. Now I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Dr. Watson, and thank you for hosting us today. We, the Federation is, I believe, 103 years old, and uh, the, the, uh, at our roots, uh, the Federation is an information organization, and 100 years ago, our main a service was an annual bulletin of uh, disciplinary actions, essentially. So 100 years later, that looks a lot different. However, information is at the core of what we do. We collect data, as this graphic shows, from uh, numerous sources. The heart of that information comes from all of the, the medical boards, uh, such as yourself. So with that information, we turn it into a variety of services focused at helping the state board community and uh, credentialers uh, and, and physicians. So this is a list of some of our, our products. To try to put it in uh, perhaps uh, more common terms, we have uh, one of our flagship services is the USMLE, uh, the medical licensing exam. And uh, from that, we produce transcripts that we deliver to the boards to help you with your licensing decisions and to see if qualifications are met. We delivered uh, more than 70,000 exams uh, last year to medical boards. Uh, one of our next services is a credential verification service called FCVS. Uh, Kim is a member of the advisory board, but it is source verified credentials. We've uh, everything from uh, identity to medical education to graduate medical, me medical education is verified uh, in the FCVS product. And we delivered about 40,000 profiles. So it was the credential of record in about 40,000 licensing decisions last year across the country. Uh, applications, we have a a service, a uniform application, is not accepted by all of the boards, but the concept is to fill out an application for licensure and you're able to submit it to multiple boards or roughly 10,000 of those delivered last year. And then we have profiles, and this is a service that shows uh, all of the background on a physician. So uh, current and past licenses and disciplinary history and then some demographic information, including education. And this is a service, all of the services are at no cost to the state boards. 
uh, don't know if you can see it, this is a doc info. We've had a public tool for about 16 years now and the tool has remained unchanged. And it, 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 it's, it was really born out of, uh, or it, built in a time when state boards didn't have their own websites and there was no public access. So the tool has really uh, changed very little in that time and we are on the cusp of delivering an update to that. So this will be a consumer site, it will be abbreviated material but free of charge to consumers and one of the things that we're proud of is that the tool will put an emphasis on state medical boards. So if there is a physician that has been disciplined rather than us uh, detail the, the, what happened with that discipline will point them to, to your individual boards and we'll also have a section if you see the lower left there where uh, we can highlight activities about state boards for example if uh, there are a number of boards I'm not sure if you are one of them that have Twitter feeds and we'll highlight that and we'll keep it up to date with uh, current content we have a number of educational offerings, the largest of which is our annual meeting that I know a number of you have attended. And we're looking forward to returning to California uh, next April to San Diego, and we hope that you're able to participate. Uh, we have uh, ongoing educational series. We do two board attorney workshops a year in various locations that are meant to, to help uh, uh, new board attorneys and then perhaps take on new issues that, that they face. We have quarter, monthly roundtables, excuse me. Uh, we have a new executive's orientation that when a board has a new executive, they can come and learn in depth about the services that we offer. Um, and then we have online CME programs. And I think we'll have, highlight one of those later. Multiple communication channels. We have a journal. Um, I believe one of you are on the editorial committee of the journal, which is published regularly. We have online publications at Newsline. Uh, advocacy newsletter. Our website is designed to be an information resource and Hank, our CEO, is a, uh, an avid Twitterer. So we want to move into the policy update. I'll give a quick overview and then Dr. Watson will go into uh, detail on a few items. These are things that uh, we're high focusing on in 2015. So we, and when we focus on an issue, we'll have a work group or a committee. Uh, Four of the big ones this year is an ethics and professionalism uh, committee uh, focusing on physician burnout. The uh, work group on telemedicine consultation, this is a continuation of work that was done recently and uh, generated much conversation at uh, a recent annual meeting. Work group on marijuana and medical regulation, this is again a national issue and we're trying to uh, develop tools and policies to help regulators. And then work group on team-based regulation. And this, uh, we'll go into more detail, but this uh, I think we would all agree is a, a, a very pertinent issue. And I will hand it back to Dr. Watson. Okay. Thank you, Mike. And, and for board members, you're flipping through slides and they're different than what we're presented because there's an update. So just to bring you uh, back, we'll focus on what's on the screen. So uh, team-based regulation and scope of practice issues. I know in the district and several other state medical boards, this has become an uh, area of concern. And actually, this goes all the way back to 2003, the April uh, House of Delegates meeting. Uh, the Federation was asked to consider issues related to scope of practice and other healthcare professionals and make recommendations. So in response to that House of Delegates meeting, a special committee was established uh, in July, and this committee was charged with developing an informational guide outlining patient safety and quality of care issues that state medical boards need to consider and legislative bodies need to think about as they consider making changes to scope of practice. So in 2005, they released that policy document, and it's, all, it's available online, and, and it, in summary, uh, highlighted for us what we uh, essentially know and is pretty much the same today. That scope of practice expansion is a controversial topic for state policymakers. State medical boards should participate actively in the review and analysis of requests for scope of practice changes. State medical boards must develop tools to evaluate changes to scope of practice fairly and effectively in order to protect the public. And the primary considerations must be patient safety, public protection, competent and effective healthcare delivery. 
let's fast forward 10 years. We're now in 2015. A lot has happened in the healthcare landscape. We have the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, integrated healthcare teams, electronic healthcare records, all the wonderful mumble jumble, and we're faced with this even more so. So the Federation has again been charged by state medical boards to look at this issue. Uh, Dr. Gan Dan Gifford, as the new chair, has established a work group on team-based regulation, and it's going to be chaired by Dr. Ralph Loomis. And this workforce, a uh, work group, will work to look at um, what state boards may need to be thinking of as they consider team-based regulation in their states. Uh, specifically, the work group will conduct an environmental scan and analysis of the healthcare delivery models that utilize interdisciplinary collaboration and a team based approach to patient care. They'll examine the defined roles and responsibilities of individual team members, identify characteristics of a high functioning healthcare team, including the core competencies developed by the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, identify mechanisms to establish accountability among the team and identify existing state mechanisms for the oversight of issues that involve multiple practitioners and span the authority of a single health regulatory board. They will actually release their findings in 2017, so the House of Delegates meeting in 2017 will uh, give us a lot more information on this. In 2012, as this healthcare environment changed, the Federation um, recognized the need to reach out to the other healthcare professionals that play a key role in the healthcare team, and that ended up being the nurses and pharmacists. So a tri-regulator symposium was held in 2012 to facilitate cooperation and communication among the health regulatory boards, primarily the physicians, pharmacists, and, and nurses, uh, that uh, at this stage we recommend that state boards looking at this issue need to implement a system for joint review of complaints involving multiple practitioners and uh, also share complaint information among relevant health regulatory boards. Uh, coming up in October will be the second tri-regulatory symposium. Uh, it's October 6th through 7th, and hopefully uh, some of you will be able to participate. It's actually very good. Brings together over 5 million physicians, pharmacists, and nurses to discuss working together collaboratively and the roles we each play in, in ensuring uh, patients are safe. <coughs> Now let's move to another big hot topic item, which is the interstate uh, medical compact. And uh, this has been the fastest moving legislation in the Federation, I think, since its inception. Uh, back in 2013, the House of Delegates voted to adopt the resolution to have uh, the Federation take a look at interstate model to facilitate license portability. In June, the Federation worked with the Council of State Governments to host the first interstate medical compact planning meeting. And by July 2013, a task force was established. And then in November, legislative language was developed for consideration. And between uh, November 2013 and September 2014, the language was finalized and then shared with state medical boards. Since then, there's been a lot of dialogue, um, communication, comments about the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, and to date I'm happy to report that 11 states have formally adopted the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. Illinois was the last state to do so. Uh, each of those states can now appoint two members to serve on the commission. The commission will develop requirements for the Interstate Compact's technical infrastructure, provide oversight and administration, and promote interstate cooperation, ultimately ensuring that the compact continues to facilitate safe and expedient access to care and physician licensure. On July 17th, the Federation was actually awarded with a $250,000 grant from the Health Resources Services Administration, and this will serve to support state health boards as they participate in establishing uh, the commission. Just want to show you very briefly, um, in terms of licensees in California, uh, our records indicate that 27% of California licensees hold multiple licenses in other states, uh, primarily New York, Texas, Florida, Arizona. Uh, that those four states make up almost 20,000 um, physicians of your workforce. 
Uh, because of all the interest in the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, um, the Federation has been asked to contribute to key medical journals, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, recently carried articles uh, that uh, you can go and, and research and, and, and look at uh, to get more information as you deem appropriate. Now we'll talk about uh, opioid prescribing, and that's Mike. Thank you. The op opioid prescribing is, uh, again, on the list of what, uh, you know, the top national issues, and uh, as we talk with boards, it is a priority to the extent that the, in 2015, our House of Delegates uh, voted to establish a work group to revise our model policy. And uh, so the work group will contain uh, medical boards, other key stakeholders, such as the AMA and AOA, uh, review the current science, and uh, uh, the work will revise the current model policy on the use of opioid analgesics in the treatment of chronic pain. So and this was a, a resolution that was submitted by the Washington Medical Quality Assurance Commission, but uh, it was easily passed by the House of Delegates. We have, uh, in addition, uh, safe prescribing CME that uh, is available online. It was launched. Uh, a little over a year ago, there are six uh, free online modules and that they have the uh, uh, accompanying uh, uh, category credit uh, from the specialty um, uh, organizations, uh, or the AMA and the AOA rather, and it's available at fsmb.org slash safe prescribing. Uh, another vehicle on this topic that has been uh, widely distributed and I think very well received. There's a, we're in the second edition of the safe, uh, responsible opioid prescribing uh, uh, book. And uh, this was a book that uh, Scott Fishman was the author of, was most recently updated in October of 2014. And uh, there's also corresponding uh, credit there. It's available online. More than 180,000 copies have been distributed and they are working on the third edition. We want you. So this is a, uh, uh, I guess, sort of a pitch, although this board seems very active in our committees, committee structures and previously with the participation on the board. So volunteer um, participation is key to what we do uh, with our work groups and committees and uh, you know, all of our, uh, the electees from the House of Delegates come from state medical boards. So if uh, anyone is interested uh, in running for office, there is information on our website about how to do so under Become a Leader. Um, there's also, if, if there's interest in committees, uh, that's available online. And then related to USMLA, we partner with the National Board of Medical Examiners uh, in the uh, creation and administration of the USMLA, and that is also committee and volunteer based. And there are uh, opportunities for anyone who's interested in, it could be question writing, uh, item writing, test development, standard setting, there are governance committees, and then uh, also special committees related to USMLA. So hopefully if you are interested, it's easy to find out uh, how to become involved and uh, we thank you for the participation that you've already provided. Talk, are we, oh. Just a question. Um, the task force on safe opioid prescribing, it, is this the same task force the AMA announced two days ago? Are these separate efforts? Uh, th those are separate <laughs> efforts. I am not familiar with the AMA. Are you uh, the, familiar? Yeah, with Patricia Harris, who's the chair of the board of the AMA, there was a, an announcement two days ago that they've put together a 21-person task force to do exactly what you've described. And, uh, you know, I think... I'm, I'm sure that there's overlap. I know the Federation of State Medical Boards, particularly Dr. Chaudhry, participates very actively with the AMA, and there's a very close relationship. So um, where the Federation is with this is that the work that has been done currently, it's clear that there continues to be additional work that needs to be done. And they will be working collaboratively with all the various stakeholders to make sure that uh, we're in, in sync as to best practice recommendations around opioid prescribing. So speaking for the practice community, I think 
we would all be um, well served by there not being parallel and competing efforts. Um, I'm pretty, if I remember a couple of the, uh, this is, the AMAs is largely specialty society, but a couple of the state medical boards are, are members of that task force and joining forces rather than duplicative and potentially not perfectly aligned recommendations Correct. do a disservice to all of us. Sure. Patients, consumers, and doctors. Thanks. Any other Does questions, comments? Does that, was that the conclusion of your formal part of the presentation? Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, are there additional comments or uh, questions from the members? No? Well, thank you, Dr. Watson and Mr. Uh, Dugan for being with us today and joining us. We really appreciate it and your hospitality as well. If thank you, you could, for having us. Yeah. And please send our uh, best to Hank. Thank you. He's we a very look forward gracious to continuing host. working with you. Uh, if it pleases the members, uh, we'll take a three-minute break <laughs> and set up for the <laughs> next presentation, we, which will be item eight. Can we ask for public comment? Oh, I apologize. Yes, of course. Council has reminded me. Is there any public comment on the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Lisa McGifford with Consumers Union, and we work around the country, and I'm very pleased to see the Federation's uh, doc info is going to be updated and modernized. Um, since this site is uh, one of the few places where consumers from all over the country can look up their doctor's whole record across states, we hope the Federation will consider making um, uh, this information that, that includes disciplinary actions in all states available to the public at no charge. Thanks. Thank you. Are there additional comments from the audience? Seeing none, are there any comments from the telephone? We do have a comment or question from the line of Conwar Gill. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Um, good morning, actually. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Dugan and uh, Dr. Watson for taking time from her busy schedule and flying all the way from D.C. to give us this very good uh, refresher on products and services offered by FSMB. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Um, uh, I just would refer to one slide, which was the second last slide on page 32, and I would incorporate my comments made earlier in the items not on agenda uh, to reflect as being made here. I didn't realize that there was a slide in that regard. Specifically, coming back to interstate medical compact, which was briefly discussed, I believe there is no need for California to consider that change at this point of time. Needs of other 11 states are very different from the needs of people of California, and we have to keep interest of the people of California foremost. Second important thing we must understand is uh, looking at the model policy for telemedicine that was drafted and look at the subject matter experts, uh, the four, namely, uh, WellPoint, Jones Day, representing American Telemedicine, uh, the director of HRSA, and president and CEO of American Well. In fact, the fourth, fourth entity should have been on the number one uh, subject matter expert in this matter because two of the main contracts with United Healthcare and Anthem went to an online group um, that actually provides those services, to which would be probably 50 million. And we have to recognize uh, Anthem and Cigna merger, if it goes through, would make Anthem the largest player in this market. And it serves its actual interest to have a telemedicine compact uh, in place. In regards to the same thing, I would also bring attention of the members of the board to the legislation which are in the process, considering there's a legislation where Medicare beneficiaries can get telemedicine services across state lines and the physician would be disciplined by the parent state and not where the Medicare beneficiary is. We don't think this legislation would go through, but if it does, this does impose a significant hardship on the state board to discipline the, on, on the conduct of the physician that will be providing care to the Medicare beneficiary in the state of California. The other important thing which we have to recognize is part of the SGR doc fix. Uh, NPI now comes under the purview of HHS, which can invalidate an NPI. I will give you a recent story. In the interest of this time, I, was, I received a recent call from a pharmacy which asked for my NPI before uh, sending a claim for a pharmacy medication reimbursement. And uh, the, I was told NPI is the new magic number, and my license and DEA is really not very useful in getting paid. So NPI now is, can be invalidated by Secretary of Health and Human Services. That's a very 
um, close uh, thing we have to follow. And again, coming back to the need, and I'll, I'll send written comments. I just want to incorporate extended written comments over here by reference um, in the interest of time that California doesn't need uh, such kind of a compact at this point. We have uh, enough need for telephone consultation. Sir, sir, we, I believe. Sir, you've your three minutes. Can you please wrap up your statement? Well, I am, three minutes is not an enough time for... Well, that's three minutes is what's granted under the rules of this board. So if you can okay, please conclude fine. your statements. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments on the phone? Our next question does come from the line of Dr. Joe Goldstitch from SCC. Please go ahead. Yes. I represent the, the Society of Cannabis. I'm getting a lot of feedback on my phone. I'm going to try another source. Okay. Okay. Can you proceed, please? I have two questions about the work, work group on uh, marijuana and medical regulation. I, I, I want to know where the, uh, the uh, expertise for the development of the model policy guidelines is going to come from because uh, the, the number of doctors that uh, uh, are versed in, in these uh, matters uh, is, is quite limited. And I'd also like to volunteer the Society of Cannabis Clinicians uh, to provide any help that might be required uh, for the development of these guidelines. And I'd also be interested in, in what your thoughts are about the position statement on regulation of uh, licensees who use marijuana regu recreationally. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Are there additional comments from the phone? Uh, it was a question. No, sir, this is public comment. Are there additional public comments from the telephone? No, sir, there are no other comments on the telephone lines. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Seeing no further comment, the board stands in recess for three minutes. Then we'll proceed with item 18. Thank you. This meeting of the medical board is now uh, back in session. We'll go to item 18, presentation on findings from the 2013 Supplemental Survey on Electronic Health Record Availability and Medi-Cal Participation. Dr. Kaufman, thank you for being with us. Oh, and, and thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, Kim has told me that we need to move along, so I'm gonna do the speed version of this. Um, so if the details are not clear, please blare with me. We're trying to <laughs> keep you all on schedule so that you can get home tonight. I um, also just want to say how much our team at UCSF values uh, the partnership we've had with the medical board over the years to conduct our supplemental surveys. We really you know, value that and think it's been uh, productive for the board as well. Um, just briefly, I'm going to talk about the 2013 version of a set of voluntary surveys that we've done in partnership with the board. So these are surveys that go out with the licensure renewal materials and your mandatory uh, survey. Um, and I've got mostly, this is 2013, I'm going to talk a little bit about our 2011. Um, and um, the analyses I'm going to show you are going to be limited to physicians who are practicing in California because what we're really interested in is what's going on here in California. Um, folks who are not in training, so those who have completed residency and fellowship, and those that are providing patient care. Um, I'm going to skip this one on our questionnaire items and jump right to the results. Um, first, we're going to talk about electronic health records. Um, and I presented the 2011 data to you, I think, about three years ago in 2012. So just a little bit of comparison uh, there. And I think the key takeaway is that there was about a seven percentage point increase in the percentage of our respondents who said they had some sort of electronic health record uh, between 2011 and 2013. Um, interestingly, most of the change was in folks who went from saying, I don't know if I have an electronic health record, to yes, I think I have one. Um, I think some of that just reflects the, uh, the diffusion of this technology, particularly beyond Kaiser and some of the large, VA and some of the large systems. Um, we then broke that down by practice type, 
And I want to call your attention to the one that's circled there. That's community public clinics. That's the group for which we saw the largest increase in physicians saying that I have an electronic health record from 54% to 81%. Um, I, I actually don't think that's surprising. Um, it's during this time period that Department of Healthcare Service rolled out the Medi-Cal electronic health record incentive program, and that was focused and continues to be focused on those providers that have a high volume of Medi-Cal enrollees, and certainly our public and community clinics <coughs> are among some of our highest volume Medi-Cal providers. They also had quite a ways to go, unlike Kaiser that was already, well, the docs say 90, you know, 94, 99 percent, I think in reality, 100 percent of them have, at work, have access to some part <laughs> of the record. Maybe some of them don't use it as much. Um, so really the big growth in community public clinics, we still see this gap between Kaiser and the large practices and the solo and small practices. Um, by specialty here, um, so this is broken out uh, into about nine major specialty groups. Um, and we see here that facility-based physicians are the most likely to have an electronic health record. What is a facility-based physician? Well, this would be uh, emergency medicine physicians, anesthesiologists, pathologists, radiologists, those that are typically attached to a <coughs> hospital or some other facility. Um, down at the bottom, the lowest rate of participation is, uh, excuse me, lowest rate of EHR availability is psychiatry. Uh, now we're going to look at specific electronic health record uh, features or functions. Uh, you know, going beyond do you have one to what features does it have and what features do you use. So here I've listed um, the five uh, EHR functions that our respondents said they used most frequently. And as you see, these are clinical notes, list of patient medication, list of medication allergies, list of patient problems, lab test results. Notice these are all things that a physician would use in an encounter with an individual patient. Um, so I'm not surprised that we're seeing that these are the most frequently used functions. Um, here we have the five least frequently used uh, functions. And you notice here that these are things that go beyond that traditional office visit, things like transmitting data to immunization registries, um, using a patient portal, um, lists of patients by condition. So this would be, for example, uh, can you generate a list, do you use it to generate a list of all the folks in your practice who have diabetes, uh, all the folks in your practice who have breast cancer. Um, quality indicators, and then lastly, transmission of data to clinicians in other practices, and I think that is one of our big challenges with electronic health records once we get outside our integrated systems. Um, that I did some work, uh, qualitative work last year with some folks in Reading, and Reading basically you have a couple hospital systems, and if you're aligned with hospital system A, you have EHRA that talks to that hospital's system, but no, it doesn't talk to hospital B's electronic health record or the systems of the doctors aligned with uh, hospital B. So just a, a little editorializing there of I think where we need to go, where EHRs need to go to really realize their promise. So let's switch gears and talk a bit about Medi-Cal participation. And this is something that's definitely of interest in our state because we've had a large increase in the number of folks enrolled in Medi-Cal. And this is under the ACA uh, related expansion of eligibility. Um, and I think the concern stems from the fact that while having a health insurance card is very important, we really want to realize the promise of that. Folks need to have access to physicians in a timely fashion. So this slide displays data from 2013 on the proportion of California physicians accepting new patients uh, by payer. And over at the left, we've got all physicians and then PCPs in the middle, and I, that we're defining PCPs as family physicians, general practitioners, general internists, general pediatricians, and then non-PCPs being everyone else. And let's just focus on the, the left for now. Um, so 79% of our physicians say they're accepting new patients with private insurance. So this is new patients. Now some folks who are not accepting new patients may well have existing patients with private insurance or another type. But 79% new patients with private, 75% Medicare, and then from there we drop off to 62% accepting new Medi-Cal patients, 44% new uninsured 
patient. So um, certainly patients with Medi-Cal more likely uh, to find a physician who will give them a new patient uh, appointment than folks who are uninsured, but less likely than those who are on Medi-Cal, Medicare, excuse me, are privately insured. Um, here we uh, look at the physicians by specialties. Again, facility-based physicians, as with the HRs, they're the most likely to accept new Medi-Cal patients. I don't think that's any surprise, particularly when we think of our emergency medicine physicians under EMTALA, our emergency <coughs> physicians and their colleagues are obligated to stabilize every patient who comes in the door, regardless of his or her insurance status. Uh, down on the bottom, again, is psychiatry. Psychiatry is really bifurcated. There is a, certainly a group of psychiatrists who work in public mental health facilities who take care of Medi-Cal and uninsured folks almost exclusively, but across the group, it's only 36% that accept any new Medi-Cal patients in 2013. Um, here we look at uh, <coughs> practice type. Um, the highest group here, community uh, health centers, public clinics, 86% of docs in those settings accepting new Medicaid patients. Now again, there may be some of these docs in these clinics who are seeing existing Medi-Cal patients but weren't accepting new patients at the time they responded. Um, lowest rate of accepting new Medi-Cal patients is in solo practice. We also wanted to look at the um, volume of participation, the extent to which physicians participate in Medi-Cal. Um, so what we did here is we grouped physicians into four groups based on the percentage of their patients who enrolled in Medi-Cal. Zero percent, one to nine percent, ten to twenty-nine percent, and thirty percent or above. Um, and I think the takeaway here is that over for primary care physicians, about twenty-two percent, thirty percent or, or more of their patients were Medi-Cal. So I think that's what a lot of folks would say is a pretty high Medi-Cal load. 16% um, of the uh, non-primary care, and in both groups, about a third who just don't see any Medi-Cal patients, new, existing, not, they're just not um, part of the program. So I think this um, is data that raises questions about the availability of physicians to serve Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And just lastly, a little bit of comparison of 2011 and 2013. So this, again, is any Medi-Cal patients, regardless of new patients or not. And we, did the, we looked at this two ways. We looked at all respondents in 2011 and 2013, and then we looked at a cohort of about 2,000 who responded in both years. And what we saw when we looked at all of the respondents, there was a statistically significant increase in the percentage who had at least some Medi-Cal patients, about five percentage points. But when we looked at the cohort, we said, okay, this is the same group of docs answering the same question in 2011 and 2013. There was a little uptick, but it wasn't statistically significant. So it seems like that in this 2011-2013 period, this run-up to the Medi-Cal expansion, you didn't see individual jo docs changing whether they were accepting new Medi-Cal patients, but we did have some new respondents, and we'd have to do a little digging to figure out if these are new physicians or just people who responded in 2013 but not 2011 who were taking Medi-Cal patients. Um, and let's see, we are uh, back in the field again in 2015, and we too are struggling <laughs> with, with breeze in, in implementing the voluntary survey, but we're hopefully going to have some data uh, to show you what's going on 2015 in the post-Medi-Cal uh, expansion era. Just want to thank, again, thank Kim and the staff at the medical board. They've been wonderful partners. Um, thank our funders, the California Healthcare Foundation and the Department of Healthcare Services and the members of my team. So... Maybe we have a couple minutes for questions. Absolutely. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Yaroslavsky? Uh, sorry. All this information is really interesting and really very important to help as we roll out and go further into trying to make sure that our um, communities are serviced by medical practitioners. But I have a, question, a couple questions. One is how many people would you say participated in the survey? Okay, sure. Let me go back here. I mean, I tried to find it in the slides, but I didn't find it. Well, it's, it's a little buried here on the last slide. So in 2000, uh, 2011, oh, we had three, well, it's a little hard to read, about, about three, we had 3,777 who met our, who responded and met our inclusion criteria. I mean, we had some respondents say who were from out, who were practicing out of state, who they responded, but we didn't analyze the data. So is this enough of a 
percentage of respondents to make it a, a, sur a survey that's yes as value? Yes, yes. So what we did is we sent the survey out to docs whose licenses were up for renewal in June or July of either 2011 or 2013. Um, so that's about a one twelfth sample because you're on a 24 month cycle. So this is this is uh, these numbers we can give you statewide estimates. Um, for all docs and for the cuts I've shown you, we can also do some large regions. What we can't do, say, is drill down to the county level, except perhaps a few very big counties like Los Angeles. So the other question I have is that the groups that are being separated out are Medi-Cal, et cetera. But what I'm wondering about is with the new um, ACA in California and the um, health plan that, that people can go to directly through Covered California, should that be a separate entity, or will that in the future be a separate entity of measured results of people that are? So I think that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. Again, these were from, from pre-Covered California days. Right. We discussed that, and in 2015, we decided, I think, not to separate that out. We were a little concerned about whether the physicians would be able to say what fraction of their privately insured patients are Covered California versus not. Like, Dr. Levine, I'm guessing in Kaiser, your docs may not always know whether a patient is Kaiser through Covered California or through the employer. Or Medi-Cal. Oh, Medi-Cal. So I think, yeah, that, that's an issue. And then, but even when you get beyond Kaiser to the private practices, we weren't sure. So I, I don't think we can answer that. I, I think it is an important question to ask Covered California. And it, my concern for Anne, the reason for asking is, is what is the drop-off if after the first three months, six months, is there a drop-off for participants getting coverage and for physicians being able to see them? So. That's where I was going with Co that. Covered California has that data. Right. But yeah, I, be, yeah, I would the say. The totality think, of services. So, I mean, I think clearly there have been concerns about adequacies of networks in Covered California and certainly concerns about accuracy of information. So I think those are important questions. Okay. I think my suggestion would be that if you can get Covered California to come talk to you at a, at a, further, at a future meeting, I think that they could give you better information to answer that question. Thank you. Are there additional comments? Yes. Yes. Oops. Go ahead. Hi. Thank. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Bolat and Dr. Hawkins. Thank you very much for that presentation. And I wanted to ask two questions. And the first one is going back to the data mining. So we're utilizing respondents um, to help drive this report. And my question would be. Are there obviously are there other ways in which that data can be mined? So, for example, in Southern California, I'll use a big Medi-Cal group uh, that oversees both two sides on our LA Health Plan, LA Care, and it has a lot of data, 800,000. Mm -hmm. So, it would be interesting to hear if there is a if you had considered that type of data mining, which you probably had. And then the second is just to make the striking, the, the striking data that continues and persists, and that is that 36 or 33 percent for, for those that have, are the most vulnerable in our population and those with psychiatric and seriously mental, uh, mentally ill. So most of us in, our, in the state, we know that uh, the seriously mentally ill um, get some care maybe not the most care, but those that fall outside. We had a wonderful presentation yesterday talking about communities of color, people that have had trauma, yet those, those individuals have really no access to care. So could you comment both on the psychiatric number as well as my first question? Yeah, so I, I, think, I, I think you, you know, those are important points and, and concerns. Um, sure, so I think those are important. Um, questions about psychiatric, I mean, these data are, are what they are, and I do think it is a, it is a concern. Um, hopefully with the Medi-Cal expansion, some folks are getting more care, but certainly those who are severely ill, severely mentally ill, and particularly homeless or marginally housed, I think continue uh, to face <coughs> challenges. And I think it's a question for Medi-Cal as to what can be done, you know, what can be done to increase uh, participation among psychiatrists there. Um, you know, I think psychiatry also um, perhaps unique or certainly special in medical specialties is that there's a lot of psychiatric care that's paid for outside of the insurance system. So you have an affluent areas psychiatrists who may not even take private insurance. And so in some places, even, even having uh, very good quality private insurance. 
can be a challenge sure. for getting a psychiatrist appointment. And then on other types of data, um, I think what I would say there is there's a need to look at these questions about Medi-Cal participation access through multiple sources of data. I mean, here we leverage the partnership that we have with the board and the fact that you send folks licensure renewal materials every 24 months. You've also got them socialized to doing a mandatory survey. But certainly I think that claims data is important to look at. It can be challenging uh, for an outside researcher uh, to get at. Um, things like California Health Interview Survey and other things that go directly to the public, uh, those are important too. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Question whether, um, if you know primary care physicians accepting new patients was influenced by the old system of the Medi Cal fee for service versus the new system of managed Medi Cal. Can we okay. tell about that? So the question is about fee for service Medi Cal, managed Medi Cal. Well, I didn't show this in the interest of time, but about two thirds of the docs who participate in Medi Cal, and I think this is tr equally true of both PCPs and non PCPs had patients in both Medi-Cal managed care and fee-for-service. Um, so there's some who are in one or the other, but I, and I think partly what's going on there is in our, well now in almost every county, but certainly when we, 2013 when we did this, the rollout to rural counties was still underway, but I think in our uh, metropolitan counties, um, the vast majority of Medi-Cal beneficiaries are on Medi-Cal managed care, so it's, it's a rare, I think, uh, physician who's in a practice, particularly a community <coughs> health center, or a public clinic that is able to pick or choose whether to be in fee-for-service or managed care. Um, okay, thank you. Dr. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> to come in, I think it's a great study that probably not really. One is the electronic medical record <clears throat> that um, I see a lot of medical HMO patients from federal fund clinic, right. and I think funding is important that they have the ability to pay for the electronic medical record versus solo practice. The other thing is that a lot of EHR still problem is that a lot of pacing, a lot of the copy. And when you review the record, you have a hard time figuring it out when the data is coming from three months ago, six months ago, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the, in the future, they need to have some kind of standard that uh, what is most updated. The other comment about psychiatry is that uh, we, in general, we lack of uh, even social worker, mental health worker. But one of the things I observe is that, and I, managed, uh, I mentioned the LA care before, is that certain surgical specialty like uh, general surgery, you take a problem, you call appendix take on the spot. Psychiatry is a problem because of continuity care. And also a lot of model other than Kaiser, those managed care, medical patients are all channeled through the middle, so-called IPA. Physician, particular psychiatrist may not have contact with them. So they're unwilling to see those patients on the spot because they have problem getting authorization, not to miss on payment, that's what kind of care. So I manage, I think the LA care or the HMO health that they should really have a system directly contracting those, those um, shortage uh, uh, specialists rather than go through the middle layers. Right. So, th so thank you for your comments. I, I think that is an important point with psychiatry, that a lot of psychiatrists are outside of those IPAs or, or medical groups. And so um, the health plans may need a different uh, approach with them. I think your copying and pasting comment on EHRs is, is well taken, too, that one of the big challenges being getting that information into your system and being able to, to figure out, you know, to date it and make sure that it's timely. There is, unfortunately, a lot of copying, pasting, PDF, PDFing that goes on. The systems are not always as seamless as one would like them to be. Thank you. Dr. Ganadev? Oh, Dr. Hawkins. I apologize. Yeah, <clears throat> a couple numbers. I mean, they initially they looked fairly decent, but as I looked more and more, they're they're just very alarming. Only minority of doctors have more than nine percent medical. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's very scary. I mean, the thirty percent don't take any. Twenty-seven percent take one to nine percent. That's that's fish. That is, they do see a few. Mm -hmm. Maybe let me put it that way. That, that's about it. Uh, that's a serious access uh, issue, and uh, I would love to see the 2015 numbers because medical numbers astronomically went up in 2014, and they continue to go up in 2015. So uh, uh, my my concern is that uh, access to care might be even getting worse 
for Medi-Cal patients. Yes, I mean, I, th I think you're absolutely right to have those concerns. And as I mentioned, we have the survey back in the field in 2015, and may hopefully next year we can come back and uh, tell you a, a little bit more about that. And then, as you know, there certainly are, you were, because you were part of the waiver work group, I think these concerns have been expressed to DHCS and the governor. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins? So everyone in the room is aware of uh, the problems with Medi-Cal reimbursement. Did your study give any in additional insight into why providers, particularly primary care, aren't? That is a great question. We did not ask it on the 2013 survey. It is on the 2015 survey. Great. There are no additional comments from the members. We'll now take public. Dr. Coffin, thank you for that report. Are there any comments from members of the audience? Seeing none, are there any public comments from the phone on Dr. Kaufman's report and presentation? Hello? One moment, Hello? please. Are there yeah, any public comments from the telephone? We have Carolyn Hello? Navarro with yes. Mother of Affiliation. I, I'm calling about my daughter, and um, can you hear me okay? I had trouble getting through. Can you hear me okay? Ma'am, we can hear you fine. Okay, well, I couldn't tell because you didn't tell me. Okay, no, no, so I'm telling I, you now. I have been pointing out what I believe to be EMTALA violations regarding my daughter being transferred and discharged back and forth between hospitals because of an HMO in Los Angeles, California, under L.A. care. My daughter's severely autistic. She had a brain bleed for 10 days. Her diagnosis was delayed because of this HMO insisting that she had to go to a hospital in Los Angeles. I have been pointing out intolerant violations, what I believe to be intolerant violations, for over a year now. I recently learned about intolerant violations. I contacted Sarah Burwell in Washington, D.C., and she was gracious enough to reach out to California, and now they're contacting me from Medi-Cal in California. That is the extreme I had to go to to get in contact about violations regarding intolerant regarding my daughter, because I believe they have taken place. My daughter was transferred back and forth like a hot potato. She could have died because of this. My daughter was sent home from a hospital with a brain bleed, even though I told the doctor she wasn't in any condition to leave the hospital. I have videotapes of YouTube on my daughter unable to walk. And I had to go to the extreme of contacting Washington, D.C. to get help. I couldn't get help from California. I contact the Medi-Cal Ombudsman, and they tell me to call the medical board. When I'm calling about an OIG, possible OIG violation. I've studied a lot about this, and I do believe it's possible there were intolerant violations. And here I am telling the state of California this for over a year, sending you all this information, and you're basically blowing me off. That's my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there additional comments from the telephone? No additional comments from the phone. All right, thank you. We'll now move to item... A 21 invest, investigation and vertical enforcement program report. Mr. Gomez and Ms. Castro. And Ms. Laura Sweet. Good morning, members. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, Laura Sweet will be giving an update on the Health Quality Investigations Unit and what's new. But before we do that, I wanted to share some uh, great news with uh, the board. Uh, this month, uh, in July, this month, uh, the 10th, actually the 14th and the 20th, we began the implementation and rollout of the new Vertical Enforcement and Prosecution Protocol, uh, which you should have a copy of. Um, we have met with all of the uh, respective team members of the uh, Attorney General's Office and, and all the investigators of the Health Quality Investigations Unit to go through the, the manual. Our primary goal was to create uh, a new era of, of uh, teamwork and collaboration uh, to reduce delays in the enforcement process and increased accountability, thus um, uh, enhancing consumer protection in California. Uh, my thanks to your executive director, Kim Kirkmeyer, and, and uh, senior assistant attorney general, uh, Gloria Castro, who provided valuable information and valuable input into the creation and the formulation of this manual. We believe that it is um, 
uh, a product that is going to uh, hold us each accountable, respects the respective uh, duties of the prosecutor and the investigator, and I think that uh, I think we'll see some improvements. I'm very optimistic that uh, that's the venture we're going to be going. And thank you, Gloria. With that, we'll go with. Good, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to take you through the significant number of accomplishments that have taken place since the transition. Uh, we're now 396 days post-transition. I believe what we've done is remarkable and demonstrates we're on a path that will lead us to improve statistics during the upcoming fiscal year. The first chart here uh, demonstrates an overall numerical listing of the things we've done this year. Um, I've then categorize them into each of these specific categories, what we've done and are doing to improve recruitment and retention, to improve efficiencies, morale, and increase professionalism. Uh, some of our efforts will straddle these very various categories, so you'll see them listed more than once. Um, in terms of recruitment and retention, the perpetual thorn in our sides since at least 1989, these are things we've done that relate to this challenge. Items that I've listed in red are things that I believe we accomplished um, because of the transition of the investigators from the medical board to the division of investigation. The vastly improved ease of the new VE protocol and the tenor of teamwork will hopefully help with recruitment, retention, morale, and efficiency. And the reason I cite this in red is because we had reached an impasse at the medical board on the creation of a protocol or manual that embodied the spirit that this manual achieves. The involvement of executive DCA management in this process, including Director Awet Kadani and Chief Deputy Director Tracy Ryan, was instrumental in the negotiation of this product. Having personally worked on several iterations of the VE manuals throughout the years, I cannot state strongly enough how important that was in this endeavor. In terms of recruitment and retention, Deputy Director Gomez and I met with DCA's personnel officer, and I've submitted a proposal for FTO, field training officer differential pay, and I'm in the process of completing a proposal for retention pay. We also developed a case complexity matrix that I'm hopeful will clearly demonstrate the degree of difficulty HQIU cases represent versus those of our other specialized law enforcement colleagues. We have also instituted competency-based behavioral interviewing techniques, and this is the premise that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and so we've tailored our questions to elicit actual experiences candidates can articulate that demonstrate competency in core areas such as time management and remaining motivated despite poor pay. Um, we've just developed a new brochure for our uh, recruitment efforts, and we've delivered them to um, police agencies where uh, people are retiring and to colleges. We've been participating in numerous career fairs and we have, um, Mr. Gomez will show you, we've really uh, improved the graphics of our career fairs. So you can see uh, we've upgraded from the kind of grapes of wrath look of our previous recruitment efforts. Um, we have 17 true vacancies today, but we have 12 individuals who are in background, which leaves us with only five vacancies for which we still have to identify candidates. Um, in, in terms of improved efficiencies, again, I cite the VE protocol because there's increased accountability for both the investigator and the attorney. Timelines are reduced in several areas. For example, an investigator has 15 days to contact a complainant instead of 30, and disagreements, should they occur, must be resolved in a shorter period of time. We have established working groups to create a medical consultant manual and an office technician manual, neither of which currently exist. Uh, for too long, each office has been undertaking procedures in its own unique manner, and we believe it will be much more efficient to all work from the same playbook. Um, additionally, Deputy Director Gomez authorized the purchase and distribution of laptop computers for investigators, which should increase efficiency in allowing investigators to update reports and check email remotely. The ability to use cell phones to run law enforcement checks and telecommunications is also in process. The phones have been approved for purchase and hopefully will be distributed within the next two months. And this was one of the suggestions the enforcement monitor made several years back and should increase efficiency. We are also utilizing asset forfeiture monies to augment our budget and paying overtime to investigators who are working on urgent and or aged cases. 
In terms of improved morale, again, I cite the new VE protocol, which demands mutual respect for all members of the VE team. Also, the protocol is significantly easier to follow than former versions. Uh, investigators also cited a lack of information as a frustrating component of their work prior to the transition, so we've implemented monthly commander meetings and mandatory supervisor meetings so that information flows up and down the chain of command freely. One thing I'm particularly pleased to report is we've been having regular medical consultant meetings with training topics at each one. Uh, consultants have received training on conducting interviews, writing subpoena declarations, scope of practice for physician assistants and nurse practitioners. These meetings have been very well received and we will continue to have them every four months. Uh, there has been significantly more training for all staff, which has improved morale. Over 300 training requests have been approved since the transition and we are concentrating on succession training for higher management positions. Um, lastly, in the category of improved professionalism, in January, all of our supervisory staff and above attended communications training that was invaluable in helping us understand one another's unique communication styles and how to communicate professionally in conflict-ridden situations. Uh, another one of our big projects is the elimination of the field office franchise. So we're tackling five issues at a time in order to standardize, pro standardize processes so that all field off offices operate identically. We're trying to utilize technology to our benefit as well and are researching the possibility of electronic file organization systems to benefit both our experts and the Attorney General's office. As I previously stated, we're putting a tremendous emphasis on training. One of our commanders is in Command College, one supervisor is currently enrolled in the Supervisor Leadership Institute, and one commander is slated to attend the FBI National Academy. All of this is paid for with asset forfeiture monies and will yield command staff with modern managerial skills that will allow for the continued improvement of our enforcement program. The next slides represent the most current unvetted statistics. As predicted at the last meeting with the vacancies and other challenges described, they crept up a bit, but I'm confident with all the improvements and incredibly hard work underway that we have reached the peak of this trend and we'll be seeing the numbers uh, decrease in this next fiscal year. So those are cases over a year old, comparatively speaking, by district office. Cases over 550 days old and by district office, by field office. So I would like to conclude by acknowledging that three of our investigators were recognized by the Federal Department of Justice for their outstanding work on criminal cases during the past year. Supervising Investigator Laura Guardhouse, Investigator Larry Bennett, and Supervising Investigator Carmen Aguilera Marquez were awarded at this ceremony. Our staff were among the likes of the detectives who broke the Sony hacking case, detectives who prosecuted human trafficking rings, and other very high profile and serious cases that were successfully prosecuted. Um, our investigators have won five of the, these awards during the past five years, which is a testament to their passion and dedication for fulfilling our mission of public protection. And with that, I want to thank our investigators, supervisors, and commanders for all of their tireless work this past year and prospectively for what I believe will be a fruitful and productive 2015-2016. That concludes my report. Thank you for that report. Uh, does Ms. Castro want to give a report? Okay, got it. All right, thank you. Dr. Levine? It, it may be, because the questions may encompass the portion of your report, if that's okay. Happy to do it. Um, my report is pretty much limited to the vertical enforcement and prosecution protocol from July 2015. Uh, the negotiation team um, was very, very... Ms. Castro, can you adjust your mic? Oh, sure. Was very, very motivated to get this off the ground, um, and I'm very proud of what came out. And I have uh, Mr. Gomez and Ms. Sweet to thank, and in addition, Awit Kadani and Tracy Ryan, who attended every single meeting, and the meetings were facilitated by former staff counsel Anita Scurry, and of course, our client Kimberly Kirchmeyer. So, uh, our goal of public protection can only fully be realized if we work together to ensure that California's medical licensees do not violate the trust that the public has placed in them. And we, we must do that jointly, as the board pointed out to us in directing us to come up with a joint manual. We 
do everything that we can to share information and use our mutual areas of expertise to collaborate on investigations and to bring, most importantly, effective enforcement actions against doctors who endanger the public. Our mutual dedication to that goal is what drives us forward and the new protocol will give us an important roadmap to help us get the job done. So thank you again for requesting a joint manual. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to add to my vertical enforcement report is that now that we have a joint protocol in place, we are going to be working in earnest not only on training like Ms. Uh, Laura Sweet has pointed out, to which she invites our members of our legal staff to, but also to get um, a cloud concept off the ground so that we that way we can have the same file at the same time between lawyers and investigators who are not only not co-located, but are sometimes out in the field and out and about. So I think that the cloud uh, collaboration, which is supported by my office, um, is in full swing. Uh, DOJ security, the Hawkins Data Center, and technical staff have been reviewing all of the options available to us for document collaboration software. The proposed collaboration software is called M-Files, and it's being considered alongside existing DOJ solutions, such as ProLaw, to determine which application will best meet the business requirements of HQE and HQIU, and DCA and the Division of Investigation, and of course, um, Ms. Kirchmeyer's staff back at headquarters. And all, doing all this while maintaining um, the Department of Justice Information System Security Standards so we can guard the privacy of our patients. We definitely consider ourselves the guardians of patient privacy, and we take that uh, very seriously. So I hope to be able to put together a pilot um, along with Mr. Gomez's staff as early as uh, mid-September and we're very committed to making that happen and then to rolling that out to, uh, you know, just get to the low hanging fruit of not waiting around for documents, having it in more real time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, questions or comments from the members now. I'll look to my right. I saw Ms. Yaroslawski. So I want to thank you all for your report. Uh, it sounds finally that the, the corner has been turned and I've got to compliment you on what I'm hearing. But to that end, is there a way we can get members of the um, medical board could get copies of the slides you presented, please? Thank you. Dr. Levine? Just a quick question. Windows tinting? Yes. That is a big morale, and it's also we're doing so many undercover operations that it's a, an officer safety issue. So it, Okay, thanks. Yeah. It just looked funny, yeah, but sure. mm -hmm. so it, the question. idea is that no one can see Correct. into the car. And can't see equipment and things like that, yeah. Dr. Lewis? Um, Ms. Sweet, can you help me understand these figures? Because I, I, first of all, I couldn't see them from the side here. What's important for me is to know that from today to next week, you're better. From next week to the following week, you're even better. And I can't see from those figures whether you've each period you've improved and shortened the time. It's okay to see it in aggregate for the whole year, mm -hmm. but what's important for me is that period of time, okay. did you make a better improvement? And then again, did you, were, you, were you even better? We can absolutely accommodate that for the next, for yeah, the next meeting. Yeah, because for me, it doesn't help me that you learn from your mistakes, or mistakes, you know, it's a broad term. Do you know what I mean? So if you could do that the next sure. time, then I could see that each increment, sure. God, we figured it out, we're, we're even better this sure. time. And, and again, the caveat is this is completely unverified data. Well, of we, course. we can't extract the data, so this really is almost, I hate to say Flintstones, but. Well, it's, Flintstones it's, is it's, better than. It's better than know, nothing. Prehistoric. <laughs> uh, Dr. Balot. Yeah, thank you very much. I had a question for you. I, I'm looking here at the manual, and the one, two questions actually. The first one is, of all the cases that you have, how many go out to expert review? So, meaning as an expert reviewer, if you have a sense, is it 25%, 50%? And then the second piece, having been an expert reviewer, what are you doing? It sounds like internally you're doing a lot for the, the, the individuals, but how about for the experts that are writing and trying to learn at the same time to respond to these cases? Okay. I would estimate approximately 80 percent 
of cases go out to expert once, but I have to give the, the caveat. The cases are first worked up in the central complaint unit at the medical board. So approximately 20% of all complaints go to a field office. So they've already been they've already been reviewed at that point. But once they get to the field, I would estimate about 80%. Um, in terms of the expert reviewer, now the medical board retains the expert reviewer program. Um, when we were still with the medical board, we were putting on training. I don't know if you had an opportunity to attend the training that we did put on, very interactive. So I would have to defer to Kim on future training efforts. Yeah, so this is a joint effort, actually. We'll have to have HQIU assist us in this. But um, now that we've hired our new chief of enforcement, we will get back in the process of doing those on a yearly basis, um, if not twice a year um, to train the experts. So we have two opportunities for them to attend. Thank you. A question for Ms. Castro. Um, putting this in the cloud is a great idea so people can have access. Is there any risk of this getting hacked? I just hear things getting hacked all the time. I just want to make sure that we're not going to be seeing this on New York Times or LA Times or something. The state of California has uh, the Criminal Justice Information System Bureau. Uh, which runs CLATS, which is the California Law Enforcement uh, Tracking System, um, Megan's Law. Uh, we feel that it's pretty secure and it's very encrypted. And yes, and that is why it's taking so long, quite frankly, um, because we also have more challenges after having learned from Breeze. We have definitely more IT oversight over anything we purchase. So um, while I would have loved to have a cloud already. It has to be the right cloud. It cannot be Dropbox. It cannot be uh, something that is just, you know, the copy of things are just going to be floating out there. So while um, I'd like to think that it's hack proof, I guess, you know, we're, we're taking that very, very seriously. Yeah, D and, DOJ, oh, I'm DOJ has a reputation right. for having a Fort Knox. <laughs> really, that, that's going to tempt fate, but it's, they really take it that's quite right. serious. Dr. Yip? Do you have a shortage of DAG? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Do you have a shortage of uh, DAG, the Deputy Attorney General, particularly working for the health? Oh. Well, it's an interesting question. I, don't, I believe that we do, but we don't. And here's why uh, that's the answer. Um, our attorneys are supposed to work as many hours as required to do the job. So they're not 40 hour a week employees. Um, if a week takes 80 hours to be able to do all the work that you have to do that week, then you're working 80 hours. So we do absorb a lot of that. More than half of my staff is working at 125%. So that means they're working for, to just earn their keep plus another quarter of a DAG. I am on paper short three positions, but in reality, uh, we just turn out the work as much as we can and as quickly as we can and as thoughtfully as possible consider in consideration of due process and everything else. Um, I think that the delineation of roles in the protocol will also help that very much. Um, so then that way uh, the attorneys and the investigators are working in tandem on their respective roles. And as long as everybody's working to their full potential with the support of their supervisors and have good morale, I think that we don't feel understaffed most days, but sometimes it is overwhelming. Yeah. But we you. don't have a retention issue. Um, I read in the Wall Street. I read in the Wall Street Journal this morning: 20% of the law school pay the graduate 12 to uh, 2,400 dollars a year to work for new jobs. So maybe you can tap into that talent pool. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments or questions on the report, the vertical enforcement program and investigation? No, seeing none. Well, thank you for that report and the manual. That's fantastic. Um, are there any comments from the public on item 21, this report? Seeing no comments from the audience, are there any comments from the telephone? No, sir, there is no comment. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 22, discussion and possible action on the midwifery challenge program offered by Maternidad La Luz. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Yes. I, I just, since we took one item out of order, sure. 23, just to make it clear for the public that the comments are for both uh, 21 and 23. Oh, okay. I don't. Oh. I, no. Uh, forgive me. I guess there's. It's okay. 
No problem. So we'll, we will get to item 23. Um, but first, we'll do item 22, Mr. Warden and Ms. Webb. Hello. Hi. So um, this, the board has um, provided just some information regarding the um, midwifery challenge uh, program for um, return of dad lot. La Lacruz, and um, previously this school had um, a, a approved a challenge program, but the law had changed. And so now that the law has changed, then we are um, requesting that uh, the schools that had challenges programs to prove that they meet the new requirements. Um, this school has complied with that request and submitted the documents that were necessary for the, us to review. The staff has reviewed that information and then provided that information to myself and Ms. Webb. We've reviewed it and concurrently agree with the staff that this um, school meets the challenge requirements based on um, Business Impression Code 2513. And I'm requesting that the board uh, consider approving this challenge mechanism based on the requirements of 2513. I make that motion. There's second. a motion and a second. Members, are there any discussion or comments on the motion to approve? Seeing none, are there any comments from the audience? No comments from the audience. Any comments from the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Excuse me, Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. I think that concludes item 22. Thank you, Kirk. We'll now move to item 23 update from the Attorney General's office. Ms. Castro. Hello again. Uh, just briefly, uh, we just hired two fabulous stags um, down in San Diego. We hired uh, Mr. Michael Yun from the Tulare District Attorney's Office, and we also hired Leanna Shields from the San Diego City Attorney's Office. So they co will complement the rest of my team um, that is very committed to this important work and love with what they do with a passion. Also, I'd like to just report that uh, we have filed our responsive brief in the Lewis versus Medical Board uh, Supreme Court case in California. That case involves cures and whether or not um, the board should continue to use it. And so you heard from my office previously from Mr. Sumner, this is just a legal challenge based on privacy and trying to have you as the board go through extra hoops to be able to get at the information that you need to protect the public in your investigations. And so I believe that the brief is very excellent. The Solicitor General um, took a very strong hand in the drafting of the brief and it was shared with um, our client and Ms. Webb and I believe that I will be able to update you, hopefully, with a hearing schedule on that. And with that, that concludes my Attorney General report. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the members on the report? Seeing thank you. None. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Castro. Seeing none, are there any comments from the audience? No. Are there any comments on the telephone? No comments from the phone. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move to item 24, update on the Physician Assistant Board. Dr. Bishop. Thank you. Uh, the board went live with our Breeze online renewal system in May. The website was updated to reflect the availability of this new service, and so far staff is not experiencing any issues with the system. Board staff has reported they are now receiving fewer paper renewals in the office and they are more quickly able to resolve last minute renewal issues by directing licensees to renew online. This of course is cutting down on staff time spent on questions about license renewals of which they typically receive many at the end of each month. The board's website has been updated to provide licensees with information regarding the Cures 2.0 rollout and registration requirements. 
a regulatory hearing on the proposed language for guidelines for imposing discipline, uniform standards regarding substance using healing arts licensees was held on February 9, 2015. The board voted to approve additional amendments and a 15-day public comment period took place. No public comments were received. Thus, the rulemaking file was finalized and has been submitted to the Department of Consumer Affairs for their review. Upon their approval, the file will be forwarded to the Office of Administrative Law. State Bill 2102 was effective January 1, 2015. It requires Physician Assistant Board and several other boards to collect all time at the time of initial licensure and renewal specific demographic data for the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. Board staff worked with the Department of Consumer Affairs and the other boards to develop an electronic online survey. Our initial license letter inserted with the wall with the wall certificate and pocket ID card is being updated with a link to the survey and an insert will be included in the renewal notice as well. The board's website has been updated with information and links. Rollout of the survey took place in early July 2015. We are encouraging our licensees to complete the survey as the data will provide helpful and useful information to assist the state in determining health care shortages and the need for additional physician assistant training programs. The results of the survey will also provide useful data to improve access to patient care. The data will also be useful to the board with regard to its public and policy goals of consumer protection. At the May 2015 board meeting, members discussed State Bill 337, which currently is pending before the legislature, and voted to take an opposed and less amended position on the bill. The board had concerns with the provisions of the bill regarding one of the two additional mechanisms for the supervising physician to choose from. Specifically, this method that would allow the, excuse me, permit the supervising physician and physician assistant to conduct medical reviews, uh, medical records review meetings at least 10 times annually. The board believed that the proposed 10 times annually medical records review meeting was too open-ended. The board believed that the time frame should be more precisely defined. Additionally, the board noted there were no documentation provisions for these meetings. Finally, the board believed that there should be a baseline of the number of cases reviewed at the meetings. At the July 13, 2015 teleconference board meeting, the California, California Academy of Physician Assistants, sponsors of SB 337, provided amendments to the bill which addressed the board's concerns. The board took a support if amended position on SB 337. A word of thanks. On behalf of the Physician Assistant Board and staff, I would like to again thank the Medical Board of California for your continued support. Uh, your Executive Director, Kimberly Kirchmeyer, and your staff are always available to us. Thank you very much. The next scheduled Physician Assistant Board meeting is on August 3rd, 2015, coming up. I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the report, Dr. Bishop. Are there any questions or comments from the members? No, seeing none. Are there any comments from the audience on Dr. Bishop's report? No comments. Are there any comments from the telephone? No comments from the phone. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for your leadership. Moving on to item 25, update on the Health Professions Education Fund. Ms. Yaroslawski and Dr. Yip. Thank you. Uh, a special application cycle was opened for new, from new money received from the California Endowment. And the application process was open to our uh, Stephen Thompson loan repayment docs. Started May 18th and closed June 26th. Uh, that there are 53 uh, applications that are will be reviewed in teams of two at the end of July, and that will finish. I'd say by fall we will have 30. We'll, we'll see how much money we have and how much is requested, but we should have a good number of um, new doctors out there in the field. We're very pleased that the endowment has found it. Um, that what we're doing at HPF is so important, and we're very thankful for their engagement. We've also been on a major um, outreach and trying to get our message of what we do out there in the community into that. Uh, I have to recognize the engagement of our new executive director, Linda Onstead Atkins, who's done an amazing job in her new role as acting executive director, where she's also taken on the role of um, our the assistant executive director to Ashbet. I mean, it's that person, Lupi Alonso Diaz, who many of you might remember or know, has moved on to the state hospital group. Um, I'm, I apologize, that's not the exact title, but I don't remember off the top of my head. So uh, staff has really ramped up and is participatory, and I'm really pleased that things are going forward, but basically it's just about the 53 new applications 
that we'll be reviewing. Thank you. Dr. Yip, anything to add? Actually, it's, uh, just for the information of our member, uh, it's interesting to find out some of the candidate, applicant, actually, people get funded, they can actually work for the, half rate, the federal funded clinic, which is right in Los Angeles County, or even a uh, ophthalmology in children's hospital. So those individuals also qualify that as long as they serve the uh, needed population. So you don't have to go to like a uh, farmland to, to be qualified too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, uh, thank you for the report. Are there any comments or questions from the members? Seeing none, are there any comments from the audience on the uh, report? No comments from the audience. Any comments from the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you, uh, Ms. Yaroslawski and uh, Dr. Yip for your leadership on this uh, important committee. We'll now move to agenda item 26, agenda items for the October 2015 meeting in, San in the San Diego area. Colleagues, is there any? <clears throat> issues you want to bring to Ms. Kirkmeyer's attention now or after the meeting. I do anticipate the board will receive an administrative petition seeking, requesting that the board take action on the physician, notifi physician notification issue. And if so received, that'll be calendared at our October 2015 meeting. Any other? Okay, all right. We'll have a full agenda. Are there any comments from the public on agenda item 25, 26? Seeing none, are there any comments from the telephone? No comments from the phone. All right, thank you. We'll now move to item 27, election of officers. We'll take the officers, we do this at, our, at this meeting annually, and we'll, the officers uh, for election are secretary, vice president, and president. We'll start with secretary, vice president, and then when we get to president, I'll ask the vice president to chair that portion of the election. Uh, we'll now start with uh, secretary. I place in nomination for the office of secretary, Denise Pines. Are there any other names? Seeing none. Yeah, second. Oh, second it, okay. Second, for sure. All right. Denise, do you accept? I accept. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for that. Are there any comments, the motion being to uh, elect Ms. Denise Pines to secretary? Are there any comments from the public? Any comments from the telephone? No comments from the phone. All right, thank you. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Kraus? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Shipsky, sorry, Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Congratulations, Denise, thank you. All right, we'll now move to the Office of Vice President. Dr. Levine? I'd like to place in nomination Dr. Gananadev's name for Vice President. Thank you. Second. Second. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I'll, silence is acceptance. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any comments uh, on the motion from the public? Are there any comments uh, on the telephone? No comments from the phone. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Now the nomination for the president of the medical board. So I would move uh, Mr. Serrano Sewell to be um, voted by acclamation as to continue as president of the medical board of California. Okay, we have a motion and second. Do uh, we have any other nominations? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> any comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Any comments on the telephone? No comments from the phone. Ms. Toof, roll call, please. 
Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krauss? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Levine? Um, I, I hope this is not out of order, but a question, is the, is the annual election of officers in statute, or is it custom? It's, it's in our, I think, board member administrative procedure manual. It is not in the statute. Um, the only thing that's in statute is the panels. So if we, I, and the reason I ask the question is, based on my own experience, I mean, I think a two-year term makes a lot of sense for board for board officers. It takes some time. We have four meetings a year. It takes some time to get into the rhythm of the role. Um, and it seems to me, if it's not hugely problematic, we ought to at least at some point consider whether we would elect folks for to hold these offices for two years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Are there... Additional comments or questions? Thank you. And uh, colleagues, I'm deeply honored um, and um, look forward to an exciting and busy year to come. So thank you very much. Uh, before we move to the adjournment, which is coming right up, I wanted to thank staff for the, uh, being here at this meeting, starting with our executive director, Kimberly Kirkmeyer, but also uh, our Council, Diane Dobbs and Carrie Webb, Jennifer Samoz, Liz Amaral, Kirk Warden, Paulette Romero, Cassandra Hawkinson, Christina Delp, Regina Rowe, Dennis Frankenstein, Elizabeth Rojas, and Lisa Toof. Thank you, staff, for making this a successful meeting, along with the DCA investigators, Craig Leader, who I saw in the back earlier, and Cynthia Verdes. Thank you to Mrs. Sweet and Mr. Gomez and Christine Lally from DCA. Um, and most importantly, the public and interested parties for uh, providing testimony and your opinions at this meeting. If there's no objection, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you.